Are you ready to supercharge your wealth and unlock the power of passive income? Welcome to this episode of Dividend Discussion, where we embark on an enriching journey through the realm of dividend investing. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, this series is a gateway towards invaluable insights and firsthand experiences that will propel you towards financial independence. Join me as we dive deep into the minds of others in the dividend investing space that are eager to share their stories, mistakes, triumphs, and life-changing lessons. In each episode, we unlock the secrets of successful dividend investing, ensuring you can sidestep costly pitfalls and chart your own path towards financial freedom. Sit back, relax, and immerse yourself in this captivating episode of Dividend Discussion. Hello and welcome to another episode of Dividend Discussion here on Dividend Obsession. I'm your humble host, Troy, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Steve. Steve, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and giving yourself a brief introduction and telling the people a little bit about who we have the pleasure of speaking with. Well, I'm... uh... An investor since about age 30, which makes it 41 years, and uh, live on uh, Cape Cod, Mass. Uh, got a wife, kids, grandkids, and so on, but I have a, a huge interest in investing and particularly uh, dividend growth investing. Very nice. So so that is a really good segue into the first question. So like, when when exactly do you remember beginning your investing journey, and then what got you into dividend investing specifically? Okay. I remember it pretty clearly because for the majority of my life, and this is probably a good lesson for younger investors, I just fooled around chasing story stocks and thinking, oh boy, I can make 20% next week or 50% and wasted a lot of money and a lot of time doing that. So as I get older, your imperatives become a little more intense because you are getting older. You're, I'm retired could use the income. So I began to migrate towards dividend growth. And that was literally 2014. So it wasn't all that long ago. And uh, I'm very good with computers. That was my original career. So a lot of my work is computer dependent, like I'll get uh, data from Morningstar and value line, it goes in a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet in turn provides a watch list over to stockcharts.com who in turn sends me heads up alerts at night. So it's not the stock picker, but it goes, according to your rules, you might want to look at these tonight. So uh, that's basically my timeline. I wasted decades fooling around with story stocks and finally settled down. And this has been going great, but you have to take the slow road. Yeah. Well, that's, that's important that you realize, like, so a couple things to take away from that is one, you've been investing for a very long time. And despite you, um, you know, I don't want to say wasting, but using the years prior, uh, less optimally, Mm -hmm. um, in despite you doing that, you were still able to achieve success through investing. Once you realize, you know, quote unquote, the correct way to do it. Um, and then you also realize that, you know, all this, I, I try to preach this on the channel all the time. All this get rich quick stuff doesn't work. If it, if it comes quick, it'll, it'll leave quick. You need to take your time and, and build it right. Yeah. And even I'll give you an aside. I didn't even write down. Even if you get one of those get rich quicks, I had a really good investing friend in Hawaii. He got a tip on an unknown company from one of his mentors. He turned 25,000 into a quarter million. Name of the unknown company was AOL. Wow. But that, that's the upside. The downside was he then spent the rest of his life chasing more of them. Yeah. And then that didn't go as well. Yeah. Well, and that's, I was, I was going to say that too, is like the other thing that, um, the, the get rich slow scheme or not scheme, but the, the plan kind of teaches you is it, it's not even about the getting rich slow. It's almost like the, um, the characteristics you develop and the, the principles you develop as a person going through that process. Like if everything just happened, like what do they say all the time? Like, you know, when you have money and then like you give money to people that didn't earn it, like they don't, they don't have a sense of like understanding how to uh, spend it, how to save it, how to invest it. Like they don't understand that because it was just given to them. You are right. And, and that's a saying I I've listened to a lot of motivational stuff. Uh, and they say that unless you value money and study it and understand it and take care of it, it'll leave you. Yeah. So, I think it's really true. Yeah. I mean, everybody always values something um, that they had to work hard to get, um, whether it's, you know, investments or a house or a car, like you always take care of those kind of things when you actually can save up and you you can say that you've earned it. So um, You're right. I do like that. 
Um, okay, so I mean, you've been investing for a long time, um, and you said that you've had decades of uh, what you would consider less less than optimal investing. So, like, what was your? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what what would be your biggest um, dividend related mistake? And more importantly than the mistake, what lesson did you learn from that? Okay, that's a great question. My biggest dividend stock mistake was Intel. I knew them from a million years in the business. All I've ever done is computers. And I didn't pay enough attention to the fundamentals, and I didn't pay enough attention to the people on the Facebook Dividend Growth Investing Group, because there are older people there that would point out sound reasons that that company wasn't doing quite so well. And so that's my biggest mistake. And what I learned from is you've got to know more about the company. You can't just be enthused because you're in IT and that's Intel. There's more to it than that. So uh, how do you, like, in in your head and how do you treat, because Facebook and the groups are, like, I feel like the groups are the best part of Facebook now. Um, yep. How do you treat the, um, the, the fine line of using other people's knowledge that they may have over you in a certain area and also, like, letting them sway something that you do have a strong feeling on. Cause like that'll happen. Like if you have a strong feeling on Intel and you like pretend this wasn't your biggest dividend mistake, but like you had a really strong conviction on it, you post it on there. Somebody can poke a hole in anything on the internet. So like, how do you balance that? All right. That, that is a very interesting question. And I find that you got to balance a lot of stuff. Like I read Morningstar, which will give you, it's more, it's not a fundamental view. It's more like they're telling you, hey, here's what this company is doing. But more importantly, here's why we think they're succeeding. Um, so I, I take that. Then I go over to Value Line. I look at the numbers. I listen to, there's probably 20 people in that uh, dividend group that I feel offer some serious stuff. And last but not least, I'm human like everyone else. Every one of us as an investor faces a huge challenge of two things. One of them is called cognitive dissonance, where what somebody says disagrees with what you believe. And the other one is confirmation bias, where you're just using the group to hunt for somebody to confirm what you think. Mm -hmm. And you have to be aware of those because that's not really why you're there. You're looking for a successful stock. If it doesn't happen to be your choice, so be it. There's lots of others. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's, a, those are really good, really good points too. Is like, I, um, a long time ago, I posted, I don't know, shortly after I first started, cause I have very simple criteria and metrics that I, I judge my stocks by just because I don't claim to know all the, you know, fancy intricacies of the stock market. I just okay. wanted stuff that one is simple to understand, uh, two is easy to follow. And three is, um, even though they're smaller things, they also mean bigger things. So the example of that would be like somebody that pays and grows their dividend for more than five years or outperforms the S&P 500. I don't necessarily look too deep at like management and all these other things of, the, of this and like the balance sheets, because if you're able to outperform the S&P 500 over a long period of time, that shows that you have competent management because they're able to outperform. And then if you're able to constantly pay and grow your dividend for long periods of time, that shows that your balance sheet is healthy enough to do so. So it's kind of one of those things. And and all that to say, I posted back on the group to, to speaking to your two things that you just brought up. I posted back on the group a long time ago. I was like, hey, um, I'm not looking for anybody to agree with me or disagree with me, but here are my three metrics that I judge my stocks by. Are there, can anybody use these filters to find a stock that you would consider to be a quote unquote bad investment? And right. it's the internet. I was expecting something and no, there was people that were like, oh, this one kind of meets your criteria and it's a bad stock. I was like, no, 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 no. We don't do kind of. When I do a filter on Excel, it doesn't say all oh, these and kind of those, like it's just these, like that's it. So, um, and, and nobody was like, it's, it's kind of proof that like you don't necessarily need to have the most complicated, uh, uh, stock filtering or anything like that it, it can work for you as long as it's well thought through and it fits your your investing style and your timeline i agree with what you said because one of my filters i will look at uh, say i'll take a general dynamics i'll throw up a 20-year chart on that and it's called total performance mm -hmm. so it includes the dividends i am looking for that thing to generally be rising over the 20 years 
I understand there's dips and sell-offs, but I don't want to see it go up to 60 and fall to 20 and then recover to 65. I want to see like go to 60, fall to 50, go to 65, fall to Mm -hmm. 60 even and things like that. So I agree that there are certain indicators like they're just doing good and you can see they're doing good. Like the, the raise, the rising dividend or the rising stock price are both good things. But then I couple in the, the great advice I've gotten from that group about, well, wait a minute, what is, how much is the payout ratio that yeah. they're doing to make that dividend? And, um, there's a lot of stuff like that. I don't grind the numbers myself, but I more go into Value Line and Morningstar, and I listen to the grinding they've done. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to say, I've been fascinated. Some great companies that you read on uh, Morningstar, they can literally exceed what the fundamentals say they should be doing for years. And usually when I read up on the company, it's because there's a specific reason they're exploiting a niche as a for instance i'm going to have i'll probably have it backwards but there's nordson and parker hannafin one of those two guys exploits a niche for pumping heavy liquids that nobody else wants to go through there and do so when you're exploiting a niche you can charge a higher margin if you have a higher margin you might begin to exceed some of the normal fundamentals so that's that's the kind of things i look at yeah that that's that's really good and um i the the payout rate. If I had to add a fourth thing to my uh, criteria, which I might do a video on this, maybe at the beginning of the year, um, it would be the payout ratio. I don't really know what my I I, need the, I know the you know industry standard for a quote unquote safe pay, payout ratio is like sixty percent. Um, I kind of want a little lower than that, maybe fifty percent at, at least or at most. Um, strictly because the other criteria, my other third criteria is I want a dividend growth rate over the last three, five, 10 years to be 10% or higher. So okay. if I want that dividend growth rate to be so high, I need there be room to do so, which is the payout ratio. Um, yep. So, I mean, yeah, it's it's I, I, I like all those things. And, and there's always something cool that I learned from the interviews and hopefully the people watching or listening learn as well is like there's always some kind of cool filter that like I've never even thought about. And like what you were just saying about like a company basically doing the dirty work that nobody else in their, their industry or sub industry wants to do. So they get to make a lot of money doing it because you know, they're the only ones that do it. Exactly. And your morning star for some reason focuses on that and they'll tell you like uh, some companies have autonomous management divisions. So maybe there's five parts of the company, but they told each manager You're responsible for yours. We're not going to trample your decisions. So go make some good ones. And to me, that's better than if you have one central management crushing everybody and saying, you've got to do it my way. There's, as I've said about investing in general, there's many ways to make money. So it's good they allow the freedom. And like I said, uh, the, the guys who exploit a niche, there's another term I learned from Morningstar called razor and blade marketing. It's literally as accurate as Gillette. Like if you buy their whole razor kit, they want to sell you the blades and they also sell you the shaving cream. Mm-hmm. And an example besides Gillette is uh, Ecolab. They sell you all the safety stuff around you in your factory and they also sell you all the stuff that goes in it. Yeah. So I've learned a lot of those things that make them successful. Yeah. And that, that's kind of speaking on like um, some of the companies that w- some people would consider like monopolies. Um, or even duopolies. Like I know I watch uh, Joseph Carlson on YouTube and uh, he, that's what he invests in is either monopolies or duopolies. And I, I own some of those as well. Like um, I, I own Visa and Visa is, they, they run, they run the show. It's between them and MasterCard. You have other options, but I mean, at the end of the day, you ask 90% of the people like what's in your wallet, not a, not a plug for capital one, but you ask them, you're going to pull out a Visa or a MasterCard. You're right. It's really, really true. And where is your card going to be most accepted? It's the places you take a Visa or a MasterCard. Yep. Like I wouldn't run around, and this is no offense, but I wouldn't run around with a Discover card or something. Even American Express, some of the stores don't want it because they charge a higher percent. Yep. Yeah. So it, you're right. So I, I do I do like that. Um. Okay. Okay. So Next question for you. Since you've been investing for so long, um, how has your invest like you've invested for so long and you've learned a bunch throughout the years as the, the, the decades, actually. So how has your investing style changed from when you started until now? All right. It's changed crazy. Um, one, because of computers. 
too, because uh, the world of investing brokerages is different. And three, I would say just the, the school of hard knocks. And I'm always totally upfront with everybody. Um, I don't mind discussing huge mistakes. One day, decades ago, I was sitting reading the Boston Globe on a Saturday, and they had an article about a company called Lojack. I don't know if you ever heard of them, but mm. they invented a device that could go in cars. And if somebody stole your car, the state police had all the um, computers to track your car. They could just go right down to a freight yard and find your car. So I thought, this is incredible. Let me go buy that. And I run out on Monday, probably with everyone else in New England, and bought a low float, small cap stock. That didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, to get back to your question, um, in the old days, the, the internet wasn't even publicly available when I started. And um, I had read, and this is all connected, but I read a book by Marty Zweig, and it was called Winning on Wall Street. The book has got to be 30, 40 years old. He got into this big chapter and verse study on how investment advisors as a group when they are most discouraged and telling their clients to maybe sell stuff, it turns out to be that's very close to the bottom of the market. You got to translate to English when all those experts that everybody was told was an expert are most discouraged. It's the time for you and I to be buying a quality stock. Mm -hmm. And I always toss that in quality mutual fund, quality stock. I'm not talking about buying a, a high flyer or something because then you're on your own. So anyway, back then, I went to the Boston Public Library with a first-generation laptop that ran off floppy disks, and I had to spin through Barron's on microfiche to catalog what Marty Zweig was talking about, which was um, the put-call ratio, which, by the way, he invented. So, And also advisor sentiment, those two things. They're what you call contrarian indicators. So I uh, loaded years of them into a first generation Excel spreadsheet it wasn't even called that. I forget what it was called, but it wasn't Excel. It wasn't even Lotus. And so I could study those patterns he was talking about, but looking over the decades. And it became clear when you had a major sell-off, or like I always say in the group, not a dip. I'm talking about a major sell-off. Those type of indicators would throw out the same numbers. So if you were in the middle of a major sell-off during the COVID pandemic, you could look at the data going back 20 years and go, wait a minute, we've seen this before. It's a major sell-off, good time to buy something solid. It's not a good time to plunge. You know, the guys in the uh, dividend group have, have really helped me learn that. I All I do is I'll scale into something or I'll gently scale out of something, and I never leave a good position. I might just sell off 10% of it. Uh, don't plunge in or out of anything because the market has a way of spanking you for that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I learned my my lesson with uh, NVIDIA, which recently just went up again. Um, it, I mean, I'm still OK. Like I, I've said in numerous interviews, I'm still OK with the decision. I put it in. You know, I balanced out my portfolio. I put the the new money into Costco, which I love. I, I love the holding. Um, but yeah, I, I, I know I I only bought. And so this is a good lesson is I only bought NVIDIA because of that group when I first joined, the, and which you should never do. When I first joined the group, I was, you know, I, I don't know if it was a question I asked or somebody else asked, but I saw comments with a bunch of people putting NVIDIA, 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 which, I mean, we can talk about it in the group because it technically pays a dividend, even though I feel like it's illegal to call it a dividend stock with its, <laughs> I think it has a 0.03% yield, um, which is gross. Um, but they, um, so I only bought it because of that. So I didn't have any internal justification on why I wanted to buy the stock other than other people said it was a good stock. Um, which is why my confidence in the stock was always so wavering because I didn't justify it and, and, um, you know, convince myself of why I needed to own this. Um, and those, those stocks are ne they'll never treat you right. Cause like, even if it's a winner, like Nvidia was for me, I ended up getting a 55% gain on Nvidia, but then I sold it. And literally, I think four days later they had earnings and went up 25% after hours. And now they're, right. I think I sold it at three 30 and now they're like four something, something, um, but, but at the end of the day, like I said, I'm okay with the decision and the lesson learned behind that is it, no matter if somebody recommends, whether it's me or somebody else recommends you a stock, the idea is that you go in and convince yourself of why the stock is good, why it fits your criteria. Yes. 
and and don't allow yourself to convince yourself against a whole people bunch of people talking to with sound reasoning. I see that a lot on the dividend group. These guys, I'd say there's 20 of them that have some wicked sound reasoning based on tons of research. At the very least, anybody that feels a disagreement should go, well, let me go check those numbers. Maybe, because uh, they say one aspect of being a critical thinker is being able to take in somebody else's data and the ability to change your mind based on new data mm -hmm. rather than being locked in on it. And and I, I'm not preaching because I'm talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is a hard, like they, you know, I'd probably say 60% of the stock market's emotion and 35% of the stock market is time. And then the other 5% is whatever you can think of. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what else it would be, but like, if you can be in there for time, you can almost erase, like time doesn't necessarily fix all mistakes, but you can, you can erase a lot of the mistakes you, like you did. Like you said that you spent decades making what you'd consider to be, you know, wrong decisions, but then yes. you really honed in over just the last nine years on a, on a sound strategy. And it's it, no, no pun intended paid dividends since then. Really? It, it's really true. That was the other thing I was going to say earlier. There's a guy in that group that recommends to everybody that's starting out, Keep a ledger of what you buy and why you bought it. What was your reasoning at that moment? And I've said the same thing, and it's not to be mean, but if you go back to that ledger a few years later, and if you can honestly go and read it without flinching, you'll learn harsh lessons sometimes, but they're valuable lessons, and you wrote them. So mm -hmm. I, I always thought that was good, and um, you know, just basically learning from your mistakes as you go on. Don't, like... If, if you buy a stock and it doesn't go well, don't try to blame it on a hundred other things. Just go, I own this and how can I do better next time? Which yeah. is what you said earlier. That, that's, that's super important is like, no matter whether it's something that you did correct or something you did incorrect, the, the biggest thing, and that's why like when I asked that lessons, or not the lessons, but your biggest dividend mistake, more importantly is what did you learn from that? Because... If you didn't learn from what caused you to pick a good stock or what caused you to pick a bad stock, you're going to do both. Well, the good stock is harder to do like that one. No matter if you did or didn't learn the lesson, it's just harder to do in general. But if you didn't learn why you picked a bad stock, you're going to pick another bad stock. That's just, I mean, you're probably going to pick another bad stock anyway, but at least you won't pick a bad stock for the same reason that you picked the last bad stock. Yeah. And so you hit on something else earlier was like you need to come into the group. Some of them are mentioned like 40 times a day. It's not, I don't know how to say it tactfully, but you have to, that's kind of a warning sign. You have to say, well, I definitely want to study that, mm -hmm. but you can't get all excited by it because it almost feeds on itself sometimes. And in that group, we've all seen things come and go that were highly pushed at the time. Um, it's just a good lesson for do your own, do your own research. Same thing with, if somebody comes out with, well, I call them memes. They're like commonly accepted phrases that people just run with it and they don't necessarily check. So they say uh, you can't time the stock market, but who's who's ever checked? Is it even possible to partly time the stock yeah. market? There um, was, I, don't remember, is, I don't remember. Sorry to cut you off. Um, I, I don't remember who it was, and I don't even know if they're still in the group, but it was probably, I don't, I don't know how long I've been in that group. Let's just say two years. It was probably a year and a half ago. It was shortly after I first got in there. Somebody did a study that I remember they put it on a PDF and they went through and were, they were trying to test that timing the market. And what they did was they said, okay, I'm going to hypothetically buy this stock every Monday at 9 a.m. And then they went through and bought that stock hypothetically every day at 9 a.m. And then they went through and literally backwards tracked it to see when the ex like when the high and low of the day was and if you would have perfectly timed it what the difference would have been and yeah. like it it was a really cool I, I don't remember the super outcome I know obviously if you bought it at the super low every day you'd have more money but like the super low every day was so different like sometimes it was at nine o'clock right when the stock market opened it was low and then it went up five percent a day and you that was you bought it at perfect timing but um the like it was like, okay, today it was at 2.11, the perfect time was. Yesterday it was at, you know, 12.10 or whatever it was. So, like, it was a bunch of different things. And that was, I, it might be in, like, the files of the group. I might have to go back and check to see if I can find it. But that was very interesting.
I, it is interesting because I've done a similar study because I'm good with spreadsheets, I'm good with technical indicators. So I've literally proved out that dollar cost averaging over the long run beats any attempt to have complete market timing, like using any indicator you want that's available on the internet. You will not beat the dollar cost averaging over the long term. The only thing I add to it is that when the markets had a huge sell-off, and in my case, I can bring up all the documentation of the numbers when we're down there, it doesn't hurt to add to your solid positions if you have the cash available. Mm -hmm. But I would never say, oh boy, go all in, because the market can spank anyone for that. You could go all in and then it could fall another 20%. Yeah. Yeah. I, you, I've even had the idea of like, like just recently, I was like, what happens if somebody would identify themselves a good holding that uh, to me, um, I don't, because I don't like the timing of the market. Um, I literally, if I identify a stock and I have money to buy it, I will put it, maybe not all the money I want to put in it, but I will, I will start the position when I identify it because I seen so many people in this group that were in that said that they've never gotten a chance to own Costco or Microsoft or Apple or all these good companies because it was 15 cents away from the price they were looking for. And I'm like, you missed out on thousands of percent gain for 15 cents. I, I couldn't agree more. And the other thing in a more macro view is you'll see a lot of posts when the market is way down. And I, I always specify not a dip. I mean, you know, like COVID, that was way down. Yeah. And say, I'm going to hold my money aside until it, it starts climbing back. Well, you'll see people point it out time and again. It climbs back so fast. It's like a freight train driving by you. And by the time you go to do something, you just missed you probably have less profit than if you'd bought it at the time you said you'd wait. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 to, yeah. It's to me, it's not, it's just not worth it. So I, I, like the idea I had, and I, I don't know if this would work and maybe I'm, I'm open to your, what you have to think about it. Um, like what if you identified a position, you bought the position, a little bit of the position, say you have a thousand dollars, you put two fifty to start your position and then you only bought on red days. Like if the stock went down, you bought now my thought, like, that sounds cool, but I'm instantly, you know, angel and devil on my shoulder going back and forth. The negative part of that I, I instantly came up with is in the case of Costco, when I first bought it, I think I bought it 497 and it went all the way to 560. I feel like almost on a like <laughs> literally a, however many days that took, it went up every day, some percentage. And I was like, yep. this thing never goes down. Um, so obviously my strategy is I buy every day because I was so, I was like, okay, I'm going to buy Tuesdays at, at, you know, two o'clock or I'm going to do that. And like, it always seemed to be the worst time to buy. So I just, every day at lunch, I go through, I buy, you know, $7 of each stock I hold just to get me, get me some little, a little bit. Um, and I enjoy updating my spreadsheet. So, um, but my, my devil's advocate to my own thought that I had was what, like if I buy a stock at $500, and then it goes up for four or five days in a row, and then it goes down 2%, that 2% it went down is still more than it would have been if I would have just dollar cost averaged every day. Like it kind of depends on how long that streak is and how big those raises are and how big that decrease is, right? And you're right. You Some people and some stocks, you can try waiting till it uh, goes down, but some of them almost don't. Yeah. I mean, uh, I bought, I was going to qualify it like, I really only want to buy when a stock is undervalued according to Morningstar. You, you have to use somebody's value. That's the one I use. And then I add in a bunch of other stuff. But some of them, like Hershey's, I bought that within the last two weeks. And again, just a little bit to start because it hardly ever gets down there to un, undervalued. Yeah. Uh, whereas I, I was able to get, was it Pepsi? I think it might have been Pepsi, and it was close to being fair valued in the last week or two. So that's my thing. But even in my situation, uh, some of them, you've got to make an arbitrary decision. Like, I don't think this is going to get to fair value. Yeah. And like you said, did you want to miss the next hundred points because you were waiting for that? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't think it's worth it. And that's like, I, I mean, I posted the, uh, a video, I don't know, a couple months back. Um, and it was, supposed to be clickbaity it I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to get this channel to, to blow up it was supposed to be clickbaity but it's not like the, the i honestly believe the reason that i was saying and the idea of the video was stock price doesn't matter and the reason that i said that was because of two things so spoiler alert for anybody that hasn't watched the video but one is because of dollar cost averaging and two is because of fractional shares 
So I know back, especially when you first started, you needed to not only have a, it was a big barrier entry to get started. There was trading fees for everything that you bought. So my dollar cost average every day would be useless back when you first started because it wouldn't be cost efficient. And Ooh, it was um, like the, with the fractional shares is like, imagine trying to save up a nut, like today, if your brokerage does not have fractional shares, imagine saying, I identify Berkshire Hathaway as a company I want to own. Good luck. Like you're, ne you're never going to own Berkshire Hathaway because it's like $500,000 per share. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. that's kind of why I made that video. I was like, hey, like stock, obviously stock price matters to certain people, but like I'm not smart enough to identify a great price. And if I buy as frequently as I do, I'm just like, let me just identify a company that I like for all these reasons, justify it to myself, why I like the company. And because of dollar cost averaging and fractional shares, I can own any company I want at any time. You raised such a good point, And I, I missed answering that earlier. When I first started 40 years ago, it cost $50 per trade, regardless of how many shares you bought. You buy 10, it's 50 bucks. And uh, then if you want to sell it, another 50 bucks. Wow. If you want to buy options, there was a charge going in, going out. All of those charges have disappeared because the brokerages make money in different ways off the data streams and so on. And so, and that with the advent of fractional share trading, that's a bonanza for the investor starting out. Because I've seen people in the group go, oh, do you have any cheap, good stocks I can find? And I always try to tell them, you probably can go get fractions of a great stock. Mm -hmm. You don't need to worry about a cheap stock. Yeah, I, there was just a post. It might, we might be talking about the same post. There was a, I don't remember what group it was part of, but somebody just posted like, hey, are there any stocks for $20 that anybody recommends? And I was like, stop, like you're already, there's a mistake you're making is you're looking at like, I don't even look at the stock price when I buy my companies. Only thing I look at is like, is it up or down? Like I like looking at like if it's green today, cause I'm like, ah, oh, you know, that stinks that I'm spending more than I would have yesterday, but then the money I already had and it's now worth more. So it's kind of like a, a, a win lose. Like, I don't know. It's a win win situation kind of, but, um, so like I saw somebody post that and and I told them I was like the so many people would rather have 10 shares of of a of a piece of crap company versus owning 0.3 shares of a great company. Exactly. And when and it goes up 10%, 10% is 10% or when it that one goes down 10%, you're still lo you're still losing like it doesn't matter. Yeah. That's right. Numbers are numbers. It doesn't matter how many dollars. And I, I give that group a lot of credit because that is pointed out probably every week to mm -hmm. people. But again, first you have to, I understand, say, say you didn't have fractional share trading. I get it. You could be just starting out in life and you might only have a hundred bucks here. But now your hundred bucks can put you into whatever companies you want. I, I can't say every brokerage does fractional shares, but I think the big ones all do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with Fidelity and I started with Robinhood and both of them do it. Um, yeah. I don't know. Like to me, there's no, especially if you're just starting out, like that would be something that I would look into is like, make sure that the brokerage that you're wanting to sign, don't sign up for it just cause you're like, don't sign up for, just pointing out one, like don't sign up for Schwab just because you know, somebody that has a Schwab, like look at it and say, okay, um, how's the customer service? I know Fidelity has very good customer service. Um, yep. so you're like, okay, how's their customer service? Do they offer fractional shares? What other products do they offer that I might want to use later down the road or anything like that? So, yeah, especially if they supply free research to their customers. I mean, I use outside stuff, but I know Fidelity has a ton of research mm -hmm. for people that are looking. So it, you're right. That's and that's the same brokerage I use. I've had uh, 40 years, however long I've been at it. I've been with them. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty good. I, I know there's been a lot of uh, consolidations recently, too. I know a lot of people that have had, you know, this this brokerage that got bought by these guys or whatever. So, um, you know, fingers crossed. Fidelity. I just don't feel like learning something new. So hopefully Fidelity stays where they're at. I think we're probably safe because Fidelity's an old line, I think, privately owned, family owned uh, deal. So they may be good for a long time. I hope so too. I don't like changing systems like that unless I have to. Yeah. Yeah. It I mean, it was weird for me. Like there's certain things about Robin hood that I still like more than fidelity. Um, for instance, I don't know why this isn't a thing for every brokerage, but once you're, um, so say you have 10 shares of a company that pays out a dollar per share per year. So you're going to get a quarter per quarter that, that that's how that math works. Um, so you're going to get a quarter per quarter fidelity or at robin hood as soon as the x dividend date would pass it would you could go into like the settings and it would tell you how much you're going to get on the day that it's going to pay out 
because that's yeah. when you know it's like okay the x dividend dates passed you had this many shares it pays out this much and it would do the math for you like i have a, a separate app called the uh, div tracker and it'll do that but like because i buy every day each of those numbers that i put in there even if it's past the x dividend date it changes the amount that i'm gonna get in my next dividend and it's already past the x dividend date which isn't true so okay. like that's kind of annoying and fidelity doesn't have i mean if you can go on and change your thing to the dividend view on fidelity and like see all that stuff but like it doesn't like i really liked going into my account settings and seeing oh i'm gonna get um 15 and 89 cents from starbucks on this day because that's how much i owned when the x dividend date passed um, oh. so that was really cool that they had that, but like, I do like everything else dividend related on fidelity more than Robin hood. It's just more, it's easier. Like even, even seeing how many shares I own, as far as like how deep the fraction goes, um, oh. it's a lot harder to find that on Robin hood than it is fidelity. But yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of videos on YouTube that everybody can watch. If you are just getting started on what brokerage is, you know, quote unquote, the best and what, why it's the best and you know what it's good for and what it's not good for. So um, I recommend doing that. And if you can find one that has uh, fractional shares, it's it's definitely worth it. Yeah, I think, in fact, the um, that dividend growth investing Facebook group, they have in their file section a survey of who liked what brokerage. It's probably a few years out of date, but that's also a start. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely, definitely do your research on theirs uh, on those. Um, OK, so. Um, what kind of short-term goals, uh, either do you have, or did you have, and then what kind of, what, like when you, so nine years ago, did you set a long-term goal with your dividend investing, or do you still have long-term goals? And like, what do those look like? I definitely have short and long-term, but they probably blur out to be the same thing. My, the goal is to be bringing in so many dividends that when I have to withdraw them, I only want to withdraw dividends for my retirement. Now, right now, I'm fortunate because I also have the Social Security. I also have a side job, which is just driving cars around for a dealership. So I don't have to dip into the IRA very often, but that's the goal. And it, that was the same when I started. I wanted a small, well, a small collection being 40, a small <laughs> collection of solid dividend growth stocks that were basically boring industrials. And I wanted to avoid, um, they call it disruptive technologies. I wanted to avoid that like the plague. Like I don't want to own Kodak if I could possibly see down the road that digital cameras are, are going to blow a hole in the concept. So you'll find me owning more like uh, Emerson Electric, General Dynamics, people that probably tomorrow are going to be doing the same thing as today. Mm -hmm. It's not, not great, exciting talk at a cocktail party, but that's not the goal. Yeah. So I would say, so my goals, and if I had milestones, it would be every time maybe my dividends increase by a hundred dollars a month, which that's slow, that would be a milestone. Or if the account went up X amount per year, that's a milestone. Yeah. Um, but definitely my goals are just, long-term growth of dividend and capital that appears to be like the tortoise and the hare, but not if you look back over three to five years, then it becomes rather serious. So, so what, so I, one of my big tips for people that I always give in this interview, not for like the people I'm interviewing, but just people watching would be the importance of tracking your dividend progress. What, what role do you think that plays for, for people just getting started? I think it's, crucial you don't like you don't want to be judging how you're doing by the day but for instance fidelity's uh, statement shows you your projected uh, dividends by the year or by the month for the next 12 months and i put that kind of stuff in a spreadsheet so i can see where we're we really going over the multiple years and the same thing fidelity and probably all the other major brokers they show you performance charts on your account and they'll, they'll show you, I'm trying to get this right. It might have even been you. Somebody mentioned it to me about money-weighted uh, performance. Mm -hmm. And I was stunned when I read up on it because that's what I need. Because, for instance, I took a down payment for a car out of that IRA. So the money-weighted account factors in yep. and it factors in deposits. So I track that every month and by the grace of god i'm at the 10-year level i might have started in may of 2014 and finally fidelity's 10-year numbers as well as five three and one they're all showing 
I'm just barely ahead of the S&P 500. So it's you need a judging thing and you need it to be um, not arbitrary. Like the brokerage house doesn't care whether those results make you feel good or bad. They just show them to you. Yeah. And I, I think people should look at that. And even by the month, if you're starting out doing this, a month doesn't really mean anything. If you have good stocks and then COVID hits, none of that was your fault and mm -hmm. it's going to go down. Yeah. But maybe maybe at the one year level or maybe more like the three year level you ought to begin to see something and and you have to be harsh with your own judgment to yourself if you've made bad decisions then figure out what you, can you do come into the group and say here's what i did do you have any other thoughts and you know and i know it's the internet you're going to get some harsh replies but you're also going to get some very wise replies in mm. that group yeah I mean, yeah it, it and I say this like when I do my I, I, you know, confidently will say I have like the best dividend recap on on YouTube. My right. my monthly recaps, I, I go I I a while ago, I went back on YouTube because I was um, self-conscious about my recaps. I was like, man, they're really long. I was like, is are, are other people providing information that I'm not providing? Am I providing way too much or whatever? And I watched probably five to ten dividend recaps that everybody was doing on different channels. And I came away with like, I think these guys are missing a lot of valuable things that they could be providing to people. So I just kept mine the same. Now I've, you know, changed up how much detail I go into certain accounts and stuff like that. But overall, I really like that thing that you mentioned about the time weighted versus money weighted, because that makes a big difference unless you are at the point where you are not even buying and holding, you're just holding investments. Then you can compare just time weighted because like that's just what it's done over a course of time, but money weighted is what's done with money going in or out of the account. Like that's what most people have. Yeah. And before that it was you or someone else recommended that it was a horror show. I'm good with spreadsheets and financial records and so on, but I had a whole spreadsheet devoted to, well, here's what it says, but here's what I took out and this and that. Mm -hmm. And and it was a lot of work and it, I don't think it was even presenting the right picture. So the minute I saw fidelity, well, they they don't have an agenda or a bias. It's just here's the numbers. Yeah, so I I've enjoyed that. Yeah, I I do like that. Um, it's it's and then the other thing what you were saying about like month by month is so like it's it's obviously good because you have to stack good months to to get to where you need to go. But um, Fidelity also has that thing where you can break it down monthly and you can go through and be like, hey, in May I was down you know point six percent in my portfolio, and then in in, you know, August, I was up, you know, 13% or whatever. And you can just see like over the course of time, how it takes, you know, three, four good months just to, to build some momentum. And then you might have one bad month, but then you're right back on the train. And it's, that's how the stock market works. It's never, I buy this stock at a dollar and then six days later, it's at a hundred dollars and it just went up every day. It's it, like you said earlier, it's, you know, a dollar, then it's $3, then it's $2, then it's three fifty, and it goes up and down the whole time. So exactly i call it like stair steps and over the long run the stair steps better be going up yeah not not a uh, at&t right yeah well <laughs> i mean at&t my grandfather used to own at&t it yeah. used to be a god in the yeah. investing world but it, i i always, i read a lot of pro and con on it and and i respect everybody there you know however they want to invest it's just for me not what my selection system would pull out now, somebody else may go into AT&T at this kind of level, and in a year or two, they may be telling us all about the 100% gain they made. Yeah. It's just I don't really try for those. I just want somebody that's been going up almost every year for years. Yeah, well, and, like, that is the importance of, like, like I mentioned before, it's not the criteria that needs to be complicated or simple. It can be whatever you understand or whatever you're going to follow, but it can't be one thing. For instance, AT&T, a lot of those investors, they stop as soon as they hit the yield. And they're like, buy. There has to be more than that. Um, same thing with I know a lot of people when I first started, I was really big into the dividend kings and aristocrats. I still think it's a very good list, but you can't just say it's on the kings or aristocrats list. that's going to be a good buy. Fun fact, Tootsie Roll is on the kings list. They've been paying their dividend forever. And they have. I think the last time I checked. Tootsie Roll not only underperformed the S&P 500, but a $10,000 investment into Tootsie Roll at one point actually would have been worth like $9,600. So you would have lost money. So like exactly. just because they keep growing and paying their dividend doesn't like that is not like that's why when the on the Power 5 videos that I put out on Friday, 
I put that little chart so you can see here's how I started this. Here's one filter. Here's two filters. Like this is what this does to this list. And that's very important. Um, no matter if it's, you know, two filters to 30 filters, however complicated you want to make it, but you need to have more than just one. And there can't be just one vanity metric that you look at. Cause there's a lot more that goes to a stock. I really like that. I might have to look into that because I've got about nine filters, but I'll bet I could build a way to, to go. Here's one, you know, one and two, one and yeah. three. That could be very interesting. Yeah. But I mean, I am, um, like I said, my grandfather owned AT&T and a whole bunch of big names like that. And I know that people can buy into turnaround situations and make money. I'm not skilled at looking at the numbers and making that judgment. But you brought up the other thing, those yield screeners. I, I love screeners, but yield screeners, I almost swear, should by force bring in the other statistics that look real bad. And they could say, all right, here's one that's paying 11 percent. But here's numbers that most of the world accepts that look real bad. Maybe the payout yeah. ratio, something else. You know, when you go on online to fill out something and it has like required fields and like you put your first name, but you forgot to put like your email and then you go to click submit and it's like, hey, you need to put your email in. I but, wish on on screener like as a whole. Now, obviously, they won't do this because those companies need money, too. But it would be really nice for a screener to say, hey. Um, you selected yield. You have to select another filter before we'll we'll show you these results because like it's you're setting yourself up for failure if the only thing you're filtering for is yield. Yeah, or or even if they like, I know those companies have tons of metrics at their disposal. They could throw up on any yield uh, list that they pulled up. They could show you, and you could get your your best metrics right out of that dividend group. But I mean, I'm just going to keep pounding on the payout ratio. But they could just throw up yellow or red warning signs going, you know, here are things you might also want to check. But I, I feel the straight yield screeners do a disservice to people who do want to start investing and they do want to make money, but it points them towards, somebody said that online or somewhere else, points them towards shiny objects. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's, uh, and there's just so much more to be gained. And they come on the, that group and I see some wonderful advice given out, advice that I learned from too you know, warnings about, well, wait a minute, that's not so good. Yeah. But to get back to where you started, um, at and I'll bet you some of the members are going to make some serious dough on that. Yeah. It's, it doesn't fit my world, but God bless them. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, like at the end of the day, most of investing is opportunity cost. Um, there's, there's good decisions and there's bad decisions, but there's also good decisions and there's better decisions. And then there's bad decisions and there's worse decisions. So yep. there's always like, it's always that thing. Like I, I just yesterday posted my power five um, and I had somebody in one of the groups take a screenshot and post like other people that do similar things to what they do that had better returns. And yep. I was like, okay, well, one of the main filters that I actually used for this list is they have an ex dividend date of next week. I'm not saying this is the best stock that does what these companies do. I'm just saying of the stocks that have an ex dividend date of next week, this was the best stock in whatever category it was the winner in, whether it was, you know, had the longest dividend streak or the best dividend growth rates or whatever it might have been. Um, so it, that stuff's it's just it's just so important to, to really consider that um, AT&T like I don't like AT&T or Verizon. I personally don't own any stocks in communication services, but like AT&T could be a good stock and Verizon could be better 10 years from now, or it could be vice versa, or they both could be really bad investments, but there could be somebody else in communication services that's worse. And then somebody else that's better. So it's just all opportunity cost. Um, at the end of the day, um, in most cases, the goal, like obviously your goal is to make money in investing, which is why I don't understand why people, um, don't even factor in outperforming the S and P 500, because if you're going to try to own, um, like in your case, you're going to own 40 stocks. You're going to do all this time, all this research, all this stuff. And you're actually outperforming the S&P 500. Because if you weren't, which is obviously easier said than done. But if you weren't, like you're, you can quote unquote say you're kind of wasting time because you're spending all this time and resources to buy all these stocks. And you're still getting less returns than if you just say plop, VOO, we're done. Th this is the thing. And, and you go beyond the fact that I love doing the research. I'm yes. retired half yep. the time. And as we discussed, the computer resources today, like I get Morningstar and Value Line for free be through my local library of whom I'm a member. And I send that library a donation every mm -hmm. year. And I say, please put this towards this resource. But there's so much 
available now to us as investors that there didn't used to be. You brought up a, a good point earlier about the, the aristocrats and the champions and all that. That's where my research got its start. I preferred the champions list because it's longer. They don't mm -hmm. screen for S&P membership. And, but that's only where I started. Then I started what we were discussing. You look at the long-term chart of each one. Are they exceeding the S&P 500? And, 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 you know, I was going to tell you, when you mentioned doing better than the market, that, that is a meme that goes around. People say that you cannot beat the market. But just to consult my notes, some of the guys that are mentioned on that group, and I had to look them up myself, you know, like Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, um, Jim Rogers and his partner, George Soros. There's, I found a list of about 15 in a heartbeat that all ridiculously beat the market. And we all have the same resources. We just, but first of all, we have to ditch the idea that it can't be done. That's like a limiting belief. Mm -hmm. And then go see what you can do. And as far as what you think you can do, your brokerage uh, analysis at the end of the month will tell you whether it's working or not. Yeah. But long story short, the, the champions list was where I started and then I applied it. It's a total of like nine filters. Yeah. Yeah, I, I um, have a, a video on the channel talking about like how I filter for my stocks. And then I actually did a step by step walkthrough using the CCC list. There's a, a website. I think it's I think the actual website's called Portfolio Insights, but it's the Dividend Radar CCC list. It's it's literally on the website for free updated every Friday. So you can just go there. You can download it. Um, and it already I think it already has filters. You can just add the filters to it. And yep. that's how I found Costco with when I wanted my next stock to be. I was like, okay, I'm going to go here. Ev obviously, I don't need to do my filter for the um, dividend streak because every stock on there has a dividend streak of at least five years. So I yep. didn't need to do that one. But I went through and I went through. The, it has a one, three, five, and 10-year dividend growth rate. I filtered all four of them for over 10%. And then I filtered for a – I think I filtered sector because I had I had certain sectors that I wanted to balance out a little bit. And there was only two stocks on the list. I don't remember what the other one was, but Costco was one of them. And as soon as I saw Costco, I was like, Costco, I've always wanted to own Costco. I, I know I, I, my, um, I think she's my aunt. She worked, she's worked at Costco's for like 20 years. Um, so it's one of those things I, I've always known it's a good company. I wanted to own it. So I just bought it. Um, but yeah, like it, it's super cool. Cause that's an Excel sheet. It's already put together. It has like a bunch of other tabs you can filter by, for all the stocks, which is what I do. Um, I just put all the, the CCC list all on one page. Um, or they have it broken down by if you just want to look at the champions or the challengers or the contenders, you can filter for those. Um, it's a really good resource. It's free. I don't have a membership or anything. So It is. I was going to throw into uh, your thing on Costco. They're one of the ones that Morningstar, that's the type of thing they point out. I've read about them. Costco has a really good uh, treatment of their workers and they make them feel like more part of the team. And a lot of their workers have an average uh, time, 15, 20 years mm -hmm. working for that company. See, that's something it won't be in a, a fundamental analysis sheet. I, I don't know what you would call it, but it's a valid analysis. Like they're doing something which is prospering their company that way. Yeah. Well, I mean, that just like it costs a lot of money for a company to hire somebody new and train them. So oh, like yeah. that's an expense that they don't have to spend because they have people that have been there for a long time, know the system. It's it's way easier, you know, corporate makes a change. And they, you know, you have to learn one new thing versus yep. somebody coming in having to learn the whole system. Like that's that's way harder. So, um, I mean, they save money doing that. And then there's, you know, people who have the memberships and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's they yeah, they just rake in the rake in the cash. And I'm not I'm not mad at it. And then they pay their special dividends once every couple of years. I think the last one was like five or ten dollars per share i was like that's ridiculous i was like you can really get some some serious money on that um, and that plays into their favor because they can pay the special one when their accountants say this would be a good time rather than when you're locked into you've got to pay you know one percent every quarter or something mm -hmm. that's a full thing so that's, that's smart yeah but yeah you i mean and you know because they've outperformed the s p 500 for so long that's a sign to me and the fact that they have the long tenureship of their employees, that's a sign to me that they have competent management. So without exactly. diving deep into all these things and learning who the CEO is and all these things, like that's one of, that's like I said, I tried to find these simple metrics that really 
yeah, they might not do these other things, but like because of them, that means typically that these other things are also in line. So it's just, you know, it's I tried to like, okay, how many how many things that other people look into can I fit into this one basket of simple thing that I understand? Because like I've brought this up on previous interviews, even something as simple as like the PE ratio is very complicated when you look into it because you have PE ratios for each each industry and each sector. Like they all yeah. have their own like, okay, this is good for this sector. But like the one I give is always like the utility sector versus the tech sector. Good luck finding a PE that's the same for both because you're not going to. You're right. And, and one of my uh, peeves with all these research sources, when you ask them, say you're looking at general dynamics and you ask them for the peers, it's buyer beware what these companies will tell you are the peers. And here you get into your own research and your due diligence. You've got to know enough about the companies you follow to go, hey, that guy is not a peer of the other four companies. Yeah. They just slough them all together and then they tell the newer investor, yep, these are the ones you should judge by. Then you get out into the macro thing you mentioned. You can't expect a growth stock to have the the fundamental metrics of a utility like yeah. utilities yeah. carry massive debt it's just what they have to do yeah so yeah you know, there's a lot of stuff it's like buyer beware out there on even the research that you find yeah it, yeah pe ratio like and the other thing that ma just to make it even more complicated is some companies so even within the same sector and the same industry some companies just trade at a hot like costco you're almost never going to find Costco at quote unquote fair. It just doesn't like they're always trading at a premium and there's a reason for that. Yes. And probably not only do I agree, probably your only chance, say you were trying to get a better price on something like that, that hardly ever wavers. Well, the COVID pandemic, you could say to yourself, maybe I'm getting a, a better price now yeah. because it slammed the whole world down. But yeah, I've watched that some stocks won't get down to a conventional fundamental metric. Yeah. And imagine, you know, something's at a, a their P.E. ratio that you're, you're searching for is 20 and it's at a 20.1 going back to what we were saying before. And you're like, nope, I'm waiting for a 20. And then it shoots back up to 25 and you're like, OK, all that for point one. Do you feel good? Like, And you're right. You can't do that. The whole rest of your life doesn't work like that. You might want to buy a car and it's you want it to be 20 grand but you can't get the guy below 20,500. You're not going to give up that car yeah. for the 500 bucks. Yeah. I mean everything. So it's definitely if you go out looking for chocolate ice cream then I mean chocolate you might get a vanilla. You, you <laughs> yeah. How bad you, you know, want ice cream? Huh? <laughs> you you can't it's not that scientific and also like we were saying earlier, if you wait for some perfect price or you wait till you think the market is absolutely bottom, you could miss a lot when the thing yeah. turns. On you. Yeah, it's it's I mean, they're obviously over the long period of time with a lot of money, like one percent does make a difference. But in most cases, we're not talking about the one percent making a difference. We're talking about the thousand percent gain that you missed because you never owned it over one percent that's what like we're talking about a 999 percent difference not a one percent and that is the working valid case for dollar cost averaging is that if you think you're timing it the guy who's just going in in steady chunks i've done the math in a spreadsheet he's making the money because mm -hmm. he was there as it kept going up and up yep yeah. You know, it, it, yeah. And I mean, like we said before, the emotions make up a big part of the stock market. And if you can just say, hey, like, I, I don't care what, like, like I said, the only reason I pay attention and it's not even really the price, it's just the percentage. Only reason I even pay attention to that. I'm like, yes, I got Apple on a deal today. Like it's half a percent cheaper than it was yesterday or whatever. Like that's all I care about. Um, exactly. what, and it doesn't change whether I click the buy button or not. I buy it. I'm just mental wins or losses. Like, like I said, it's a win win for me because either the stuff I used to have is now worth more if it went up. Or the, the stuff I'm putting in today is now I'm getting a deal versus yesterday. So, exactly. Um, okay. So, next we, we went on with that one for a while, but that was really good, really good back and forth there. So, um, do you have over the course of time, do you have any stocks that you really regret, really regret selling? And then stocks that you identified a long time ago that, that you identified they fit your criteria and you can brag about, like, hey, I identified this stock and now look what it did. All right. As far as selling, I have a ton of regrets from the olden days because I'd buy something good. It didn't reward me in a week and I'd sell it. And a year later, it doubled mm -hmm. or more yep. or over five years, it tripled. So I have a lot of regrets from the old days because I was just chasing story stocks. 
and they were they were names, but I was just chasing, expecting a goal right away. As far as you know, stuff that has rewarded me, yeah, I've got dividend stocks now going back to 2014. Some of them have reached over 100 percent and paid a dividend the whole time. The ones my that I had an experimental portfolio at E Trade, so that's been going strictly since 2014. They've had some real good gains, like Danaher, which mm -hmm. trivial dividend, but nice company. And uh, the ones I own now, the more boring industrial stuff, there's gains like 60 and 70 percent. Plus, people will post on the group that Caterpillar just raised their dividend, and I just post thank you again. Yeah, because yeah. It's a a third I've received. So I don't have anything current like, oh, boy, this is an amazing killer I did. But I have a portfolio. It just keeps going up and I and I can sleep at night. Yeah. If the market crashes tomorrow, I don't think General Dynamics is going out of business as an example. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's that's really important. And like um, I think it was the interview with Dave that I did, I don't know, probably two months ago. He said that most of the time he doesn't necessarily regret his buys, but he always regrets his sells. He's like every single time, even like he's had, he can obviously name, you know, one or two that he shouldn't have bought in the first place. Um, yep. But in most cases it's, I bought this, I expected a return way sooner than I should have. Um, I, I don't know what the time frame should be, but there should be a rule that us investors should use for ourselves of like, if you're going to buy something, pretend you can't sell it for a year. Like you have a year at least minimum that you have to hold it. So yes. one that should give a lot of restrictions on things that you want to buy. Cause you're not going to be doing, you know, your short term swing trades and stuff. And then two, you're like, even a year, some could argue is way too short of a time period. If I plan on doing that, like I want to retire in 22 years at 50, but I also plan, I don't plan to stop investing at 50. Like I plan to invest until I'm 90 or until I'm dead, like whatever, <laughs> whatever comes first. So like it, like, I plan on investing for 70 more years. So like I like I, if I am evaluating things on a one year basis, like, OK, one out of 70, like that's what I'm valuing on. So, um, yeah, I, I'm I was talking in my previous interview that I'm thinking about in 2024. My new strategy is going to be I have 11 holdings and I had all of them at one point met my criteria that I set. But like 10 percent dividend growth rate, that's hard for companies to constantly do over and over and over again. So what I want to do is any company that falls outside of my current metrics, um, mainly the dividend growth rate, is I'm going to I'm not going to sell them, but I'm going to make them what I'm going to call a dormant position, where I don't add. I might still drip them, but I'm not going to add money to them, and it's just going to be like you know, however that stock does over the next however long until it comes if it comes back in my radar of you know they've been increasing uh, or they've been uh, you know 10 percent plus per year, then I can be like okay now it's an active position I can build it back up. Um, okay. but then I'm just, then like if I fall down to, you know, two or three active positions out of my 11 and I have the other ones that are dormant, then it might be time to look for a new active position. And I'm like, okay, what else can I put my money in? That's meeting my metrics currently. And then I, like I said, I'm not going to sell any of my old stuff. Just keep them there. Bought them for a reason. Now, if obviously something changes management or whatever happens with the company where I no longer agree with it, then that you can revisit at that point. But right. And you brought up a point earlier. It's like, but you're selling, I will never sell any of the stocks I hold. If they're high, I'll trim them. Mm -hmm. And I, I literally, I might, if I see a stock has delivered a big gain, and particularly if it's now become an outsized position for me, like I try to keep each position to 5%. So if it's gone up to 7% or something, and if it's listed as overvalued by Morningstar, I will go in and place a limit sell order, and this is where, as I meant to say this much earlier, um, my stuff is a hybrid between fundamentals and technicals, because I've, I've done a lot of work with technical indicators over the years. In fact, you've interviewed one of the guys. Um, that was recently. Ben, right? Yeah, Ben, exactly. Yep. I can see that he's done a lot of work. So anyway, I digress, but if I see something really want to hide that I want to trim, I will put an order at what they call resistance level two or three, which is way up there, and for one share. And the purpose of that is if it gets tripped and it sells the one share, then it will grab my attention and I can see, you know, maybe I might want to sell a little bit more. But what I won't do is sell a whole bunch of a great position. Mm -hmm. But if I sell a few shares, I have plenty of other things I could put money back into 
that would pay me a better dividend because my watch list, I can filter it every day from, you know, the most undervalued to the least undervalued, and then I can find something else to buy. And I always mention, I'm in an IRA. So if I sell something, I'm not getting clipped for capital gains taxes. That's so important. that's crude. You know, if you want to go trimming shares and Uncle Sam's going to trim you for another 20% or whatever, that's not a workable theory. Mm -hmm. But what I do, there is no tax penalty. So that's why I do it. Yeah. So, so I mean, I wanted to ask you these two questions before. I, I didn't know if they'd come up in my questions or not. So I'm just going to ask them now. Um, so first question, I'm going to ask both because I'm going to forget. So um, first question is going to be over the nine years, so from 2014 to today, have you noticed that dividend snowball really start to pick up? Like, obviously, it's slower in the beginning. Um, and then second question would be, have you started focusing more on yield now that you're older and needing like getting closer to needing the income from the things? Or do you still focus on the same things you focused on nine years ago? That, that, that's a great couple of questions. I have noticed it starting to snowball, but only recently because now I own companies that have already raised their dividend two, three, four, five times since I've owned them. Yeah. But here's where the due diligence comes in for the new investors and everyone else. The, the fidelity grand total is rising much faster than I would have thought. And I had to dig into that. What's going on is the interest rate paid on my unused cash. SPAXX? Yeah. 4.91%? Well, yeah. Yeah. So you see, the actions of the Federal Reserve have caused my interest collected to skyrocket. So you have to go, these dividends are doing great, but that thing's jacking up the numbers also. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, it's a, a balance for me because I, I recently, I talked about this in my thing, uh, in my monthly recap. I moved my emergency fund from my money market account with my bank to SPAXX. It's just six months worth of expenses. And I know what that number is, 7,000. I don't touch it. Like it's 7,000 is my, ba I pretend anything under seven or anything 7,000 and less, I, it, I don't see it in my account. It, it doesn't exist. And anything oh, over 7,000, I spend for the month to invest. And it's just, you know, I'm, I think every month I'm getting somewhere between like twenty eight and thirty five dollars in interest just off of my money sitting there, and I'm like that beats the point one percent interest I was getting from my bank. So I'm like I'll take that. So I mean, yeah, when I put that number in my you know my dividend tracking spreadsheet, it does skew the numbers a little bit. And you know, four years from now, I might make the same exact amount I made this year off of that dividend. But that's also my dividends are now making up that thirty forty or thirty dollars I used to get in interest that I'm not getting anymore. So. That's a, it's a good example of the due diligence that people have to put in when you come into this subject. It, you know, if you see a number, like in my case, it looked a little better than I would have expected. I had to go dig into the why, and the why was the money market account was skewing the numbers. The other question you asked about yield, I do find myself at this point leaning towards, like I get an email every night with possible picks on my watch list, and then... I go look at their yield and I go look to see how undervalued they are. So I'd rather buy one of my picks that's going to pay two and a half percent than one of them that'll pay one and a half percent. Okay. And as an, and also I have a few of them in the portfolio that date way back before my current system. So I trimmed a couple that were paying one one point one four one point five, and I put the money into uh, Hershey and Pepsi, which were more up towards 2.5 or higher. So same block of money, instead of making 1.5%, is now making 2.5 mm -hmm. because I don't have a tax penalty for making that change. I'm not advising that I do that every day or make a practice of it, but they were leftovers that I no longer wanted to own. I want to stick to the 40 that are my favorites. Have you looked into um, uh, Nike? I know they just had a b big drop, and they they're a king. I, I don't know. They're not a king. They're like an aristocrat. I'm pretty sure. I'm yeah. I'm aware of Nike and Starbucks, and I believe they're on my watch list. But here's where you get into each investor's little. Um, and remind me about banks if I forget it. But each investor has things, and there I would prefer an old, boring industrial. I know that Nike's going to be selling sneakers tomorrow, and I know Starbucks will be selling coffee tomorrow, but my whole area is like Emerson Electric or um, Lockheed Martin, stuff yeah. like that. And the other thing, what was I going to say? Oh, banks. 
here's where you've got to learn about to be aware of your own, where you're trying to convince yourself of stuff. So when the banks all plummeted in the past year, I probably even posted it. I just have a bad taste for American banks because I that was the third bank crisis in my lifetime that I've watched. And the, the banking industry is not controlled well enough. And that irked me. However, here's where I had to like, you know, put on the big boy pants and go look at the banking industry is good. And you could miss something here. And many people in the group were mentioning what they were buying. So I bought an ETF that held a bunch of banks and I made money. But see, I had to tell I had to get beyond my own prejudice on the subject and go, look, as an investor, it is a good area. You don't want to pick one bank by yourself. Fine. So I bought an ETF. Yeah, that's I, I do the same thing in my uh, Roth IRA with uh, real estate. One, I put it in my Roth IRA because of the tax advantage. But two, whether it's, you know, realty income or Vici or, or you know, Stag or Maine or whoever it might be, there's too many. Um, if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick Vici. Um, I know, you know, realty income is beloved by everybody. It's a monthly payer. They increase every, every quarter. I know all those things, but, um, also I feel like that's so overrated. I mean, I get why they're doing it kind of like Tootsie Roll. Tootsie Roll's dividend growth rates, like half a percent or something like that. But they're, they're not like, when you look at the Kings list, it doesn't say, Oh, here's what they raise it by. Like, it's just, they've raised it by this many years. Realty income does that too, where they raise every quarter, but they literally raise by a fraction of a fraction of a cent. Like they're like, we're going to go from 25.555 cents to 25.556 cents. And I'm like, All right. I mean, yes, you raised it. You're not wrong. But like, really, like, what am I going to do with your fraction of a penny? Um, yeah. But it anyway, I digress on that. You're uh, pointing out the same thing, the need for due diligence and to be able to crunch those numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of people are like, they just look at it. They're like, oh, like, because if you go on Realty Income's website, they're like, we we're the monthly dividend payer. We're the we're the um, we raise our dividends quarterly for this many, like all these things. But like, if you actually look into it, like I said, they're not wrong. They, they It's not false advertising, but also like you'd have to own. I don't know what it would be 200 shares to even get a penny extra on that. Like that's, I don't know, whatever that math is, but all that to say in my Roth IRA, I own VNQ, which is a real estate ETF. And it's okay. just because like I it pay, it's part of my highest yielders. It's like a four point something yielder. Um, but I don't, I didn't want to take the time to pick a individual REIT um, and, you know, quote unquote, pick the wrong one. So I'm just like, let me just own all of them. I'll get the, you know, get the returns in aggregate of, of all these. So, um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And that's what I do. My whole Roth IRA is I have seven holdings, six or ETFs just cause I don't want to maintain it. I just want to put money in it. 6,500 a year and just leave it go. Um, and then the only individual holding is Tesla. That's the only company I own that doesn't pay a dividend. Um, and ideally, I mean, I wouldn't mind getting a Tesla, uh, whenever my car blows up and that'd be super cool. It, like if I I've seen some people say, Instead of own or instead of buying the thing, buy the company that makes the thing, and that could work for Apple. That could work for Tesla. That could work for a lot of things. Instead, especially when it's a um, what do you call it? Like a want versus a need. So I don't need a new car. So if I were to say, oh, I could like I don't have a car payment. My car's paid off. So I'm like, okay, if I, instead of me spending four hundred dollars a month on uh, now this is if, obviously if I owned it in a taxable account. Instead of spending four hundred dollars a month on a, a Tesla car payment, why don't I send four hundred dollars a month on Tesla? Like that, make that, and then I mean, if you ever wanted to get to this, you could do that as like a fun experiment. And in ten years, when I need to get a new car, I could sell out of my Tesla position and use that to buy my Tesla. Um, exactly, it's like a savings account, except that's growing at the rate that Tesla is. Um, obviously, I don't, I wouldn't sell it, but um, just a cool, cool idea. I've heard people talk about. Yep, that is it. So I've seen people comment that their holdings in an electric utility, their dividends from the utility stock pay their utility bill. It's an interesting concept. Yeah, D uh, Dividend Dave, so he's big on Twitter or X, whatever they're calling it now. Um, and I interviewed him, I think, two weeks ago. And he has a, a saying that he always says it's called turn that cash register around. And it's he literally buys the things that he pays for, whether it's his cable bill or whatever. And, he, you know, at the end of the day, like, you're making, you're paying them money, uh, to give them profits, which they give back to you. So it's like an endless loop. But I mean, if you're going to send the money there, um, now I sometimes buy things that I don't use because I know everybody else does. Like I own Starbucks because okay. every time I drive by one, there's a line literally into the street at a, I don't care if it's, it blows. I don't understand how people do this. Like it's 10 o'clock at night. 
and Starbucks has a line out the door. I'm like, do you guys not sleep? Like, how's that work? And do you know whose concept you're speaking of is Peter Lynch, who used to run the Magellan Fund, which is probably one of the top 10 of all time. He would do the same kind of concept. Look at how well that store is doing. Yeah, it's never and empty, it, never. Yeah, and I mean, it is a religious thing with people that are Starbucks customers. Like out here, I go to Dunkin' Donuts, but I won't go to anywhere else. I go to Dunkin' Donuts. Yep. So it is. it does become a one-track thing for each type of customer. Yeah, so yeah. That's good. It, and it's the same thing with like um, we have a our, our mall. I don't know. I know a lot of malls are dying, but our mall in Oklahoma City is it's the Penn Square Mall. It it's ex like so many you can't find parking. It's so busy. But wow. we have an Apple store. We're lucky enough to have an Apple store in there because I know in Pennsylvania where I'm from, the closest one was in like Lancaster, and that was like an hour drive. Um, right. And we have one there, and literally, it's one of the it's the coolest looking store in the mall. Like they have their all white paneling the the big glass doors that open up and like, it's super cool thing just to go into. And it's always busy to the point where they have security at the front and they have people letting people in a certain number because there's not enough there. Like the fire marshal would shut that store down. Like, yeah. And that's a cult like following it. And I gotta be honest, I'm talking to you on a MacBook air. Yeah. Cause I, I retired from it and one night, my computer was broken down at home and my wife just said to me you don't need to be doing this on your own time also so i talked to several people who had apple products and they all had one common answer still running seven years later yeah so i went in that direction so i understand the cult yeah. i like windows better but for me personally it works yeah yeah i i mean i have uh I have the Windows, everything except for, like, I have iPhone. I have the AirPods. I mean, I don't follow – I know a lot of people that are really deep into the ecosystem, which obviously as a shareholder I appreciate. But, like, I have a Fitbit. Like, I don't need a fancy watch. I just need to tell me how many steps I'm getting. Um, and then the AirPods just go well with the phone, and it, you know, instantly connects and stuff like that. But, like, that's as deep as I am into the ecosystem. I know some people, they have their the Apple card. They have the Apple bank account, the phone, the AirPods, the watch, the the whatever else Apple makes, all the things. Yeah. And I'm it's, just like, I don't, I don't need all that stuff. Like, that's all that's, I'm, I appreciate you guys for doing it. Same thing. Every time I drive by Starbucks, roll down the window. Thank you guys. Like, <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, that's I just got my dividend from Starbucks. I think it was on Friday and I, it was like 18, 15 or $18. And I'm like, man, like there's people that spend this every day at Starbucks and Starbucks just paid me that money. Oh yeah. That's how, you know, they get a customer base. The stuff they go in and order. It's costly yeah. when you get the double shots and all the It's other not things. even English either. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> They're like, I want a something, something unicorn sprinkle. I'm like, I don't even know what you just got. I work with a guy and I can't even comprehend his order when he gives it yeah. to him. Yeah. So, yeah. You can, you can always tell people that frequently visit Starbucks just based on when they can say whatever drink they're drinking by name. I'm like, all right, you're there all the time, aren't you? Oh yeah, yeah. That's right. I, you'll have people that never go in there, and they're just like, "Can I get a small coffee?" And they're like, "Oh, you mean a?" I'm like, "No, I mean a small coffee. Like, I don't, I don't need all these fancy. Like, I don't know what you call small, but I need a the little cup uh, with coffee in it. That's what I want. Yes, normal coffee. Yeah, yeah. I don't need all these all these you know uni unicorn sprinkles in it. But um, okay, so I mean, we we touched on this a little bit, but I'm I'm still curious. So. What role do dividend the dividend milestones that you've set and the achievements that you've gotten so far in the dividend game? What role role do those play in keeping you motivated? Okay, I would say keeping me motivated. The way they keep me motivated is if they keep increasing or if the stock keeps going up, I'm motivated that I'm following into the right thing. And and I'm always motivated by the end of the month thing from Fidelity because I consider them to be an independent arbiter. The numbers are either good or they're not. And I mean, versus the S and P 500. So that keeps me motivated. But my, my end goal is the higher that income gets eventually when I have to really have to draw the money out, I only want to draw 4% and it will happen to be dividends. Mm -hmm. So the government mm -hmm. thinks they're forcing me to pull 4%. I think I'm only taking the dividends that are going to come in next month. Yeah. And I know as people discuss, the past performance is no guarantee of the future. But then, as you said, when you look at these companies that have succeeded for so long, there is something going on there. Yeah. I mean, I, I've said that before. I'm like, what, like, would you rather own a company that has a track record of constantly being, you know, adequate and supporting and, and outperforming the market? Or would you rather 
own a company that's never outperformed the market because in the future they promised to outperform the market. Like I like proof is in the pudding. Like don't I, oh I've been around for sixty years I've never outperformed the market but this next decade's different. Like is it really? Like you probably said that the last six decades too. So the only thing that has come into play, and I don't think it affects the old line industrials, but things can change nowadays. Like even IBM is doing great nowadays, but when the PCs first came out. They literally told the analysts, we think these darn things are going to be a fad. So that cost them a stumble to flip around and catch up with it. Nowadays, they're fine. They found lots of ways to make money. Um, so I think that's what I, and I never get it right, but I'm always leery of like, could this get, is there a danger of a uh, disruptive technology? For instance, I bought travelers insurance a little bit of it in the last few weeks, but I'm a little concerned over the long run all these companies are running into huge climate-based payoffs that were not what they were used to. They are used to paying for floods and fires and so on, but it's increasing. And some of these companies are bailing out of California and Florida. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of keeping a leery eye on that because insurance company, you would think, I mean, that would be something my grandfather would have owned. But times change and, and risks change. So I'm always trying to avoid that if I can. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it is, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it is a big, um, you know, guess game. It's a big prediction game. Um, the idea is just to make educated guesses. Like if, you, if everybody's guessing, you don't want to be the one guy in there that's, you know, just throwing spaghetti at the wall and see what happens. Um, I I've done that when I first started and it sounds like you did as well. So, um, yep. it, it's just, it's really nice to be able to, to settle back and realize that you have a plan. Cause it's, it's hard to tell whether something doesn't work or does work when you don't know what you did in the first place. Right. So like, it, it's really important to be like, Oh, okay. I have a plan. That's important. Whether your plan works or not, that remains to be seen, but at least you knew what you were following that way. If it doesn't work, you're like, Oh, okay. This is why that didn't work. Let's change it. Let's try this and let's see if that works. And I think it's one of the admins in that dividend group. He tells people every, every so often, write it down. Keep yeah. A written record because and I've said it to people also, it's like what you read a year or two later, it may be rather painful, but you did it, you wrote it and it may help you, but you have to listen. It's also cool to see how much you've grown, like, cause yes. you're constantly learning and stuff. I remember I tell the story all the time when I first started uh, dividend investing, I didn't know what any of the metrics meant. Like I didn't know what PE ratio was. I didn't know what dividend yield was. I didn't know what any of that stuff was. So I created a spreadsheet and backwards calculated dividend yield where I was like, if I put a, I literally at the top of the spreadsheet says amount made with a hundred dollar investment. So I literally backwards calculated yield where I was like, okay, if I put a hundred dollars into this one, they're going to pay me seven cents in dividends. And okay. like, I was figuring that out and I was like, man, I thought I was onto something, but like, it's cool. Like it took me, you know, a couple months to realize, oh, like I, that's what that number means. Like I, like, it's cool to see that. And when you're tracking it, like we said before, it's, you can see what was right and what was wrong, but you can also, it's cool to see, you know, how much you've grown. Like, oh, I used to call this this, or I used to think that metric was important. It doesn't matter at all or whatever. So, yep. Um, okay. So this is a, a question I like asking. I like hearing all the different responses. So how and when will you know enough is enough as far as like the dividends that you receive? Is there a number you're going for? Will you ever get there? How do you feel about that? I would say if you would go to, to it as a raw number, it would be when the dividends I'm receiving match the social security money I'm receiving, which in my mind means I don't need that anymore because I retired in 2019. So that's one arbitrary thing. And also I, you, you had mentioned this question before, I had a couple other variable answers. I know how enough is enough with a stock if the original reasons I changed it seem to have gone south or if they cut the dividend, I will usually, I've owned it long enough, I can still bail out with a profit on the stock. And last but not least, enough is enough. If I see one of my holdings has done great, it's overvalued, it's an outsized position, I will start trimming that back a little bit. But like I said, I'll start with one share at a time. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty smart. I haven't heard anybody else say that before, so that's, that's, a, that's a good way to think about it. So you know when where that comes, I'll tell you where it comes from. Have you ever heard of Jesse Livermore? He was a famous speculator in the 1920s. Uh -uh. Okay. He beat the market for a while. He was a huge plunger. But what he would do, because he was so big, he'd put in an order for 10,000 shares, 
but he was watching what the ticker tape did when it hit, and then he would decide what he was going to do, buy or sell. So I'm nothing in his league. I sell the one share, I get the alert, and it tells me, hey, there might be something going on. I might want to uh, skim off a few more shares. Yeah, yeah, that is that is pretty smart. Like I said, I like to learn. Uh, I, I can generally get one to two takeaways of just like things that I want to do to add to my my own investing, um, you know, prowess when I when I leave these interviews, which is like I said, that's the kind of the goal is like something I say will be something that you can take away. Something you say will be something I can take away. And hopefully something that we said will be something that whoever whoever's watching can take away as well and make everybody better dividend investors, because like that's the one thing. So I'm a power lifter and in the power lifting community, like everybody it, it's really weird because like the difference between like the powerlifting community and the bodybuilding community are really different like powerlifters we compete against each other but if you go to a powerlifting meet everybody is supportive whether it's me versus you or whatever like i want you to do well because that means now i have to do better to beat you and like at the end of the day some days it's just not your day you have to all this training all these cycles and all this stuff you have to do all this stuff just to be strong on one saturday like <laughs> that's what it comes down to and some days it's just not your day like it's too heavy it's you know you didn't get good sleep your your stomach's messed up or whatever it might be it's just not your day um but it's and it's a sort of community yeah and yeah it's it's more like that versus the bodybuilding community everybody's like if you win i can't win like obviously it's like that in powerlifting but like it's you know how i look versus how you look or whatever um, and I feel like the dividend community has an option or opportunity to be more like the powerlifting community, because if you make a dollar, it doesn't mean I can't make a dollar. There's not only one dollar that we're all chasing. We're chasing dollars and you can make dollars and I can make dollars. Exactly. And that comes to something I always say. There's many ways to make money in the market. I think the only mistake people can make is to say my way is the only way. Mm -hmm. So discussions like this helps all these people gain ideas to go do what they want to do. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and at the end of the day, like, like I said, if, if this interview can spark something to make you have a strategy and go out and try it, you might find out that that strategy is the greatest thing ever. And you might want to come on your own episode and tell us all about it. Or you might be like, Hey, you know, I had this strategy. I was listening to that interview and it doesn't make sense. And you might want to change it or whatever it might be. Um, cause I mean, unless you got really lucky, I highly doubt anybody that invests for over 10 years is going to have the same exact strategy from the day they started to the day they stopped. Like, I don't, I don't know anybody that's ever done that. Um, so it, it, you're, that's the big thing is adapting. Um, I know when I first started learning about like personal finance and stuff during COVID, I was listening to a lot of not listening to, but I watched a couple videos of Dave Ramsey. And I think that's one of the things that he could do better is he's really good at being a good teacher for the people that are financially ignorant, in my opinion. Like he's yep. really good at like, you know, as far as like the dividend snowball versus dividend avalanche. Like for those that you don't, that of you that don't know, the dividend snowball is paying off the smallest amount of your debt first and then taking that amount plus the amount you paid off and rolling it into the next uh, debt. Um, it's a better emotional feeling because you are paying off those debts which is why he preaches it general good for most audiences, but the more practical and like smarter way to do things would be the avalanche method, which is pay off your highest interest rate first because it's costing you the most money. Um, that, yeah. Yeah. So like, that's one thing that he does. And another thing he does is he still preaches like mutual funds when ETFs offer better returns with lower fees. Um, all that to say, what we were saying before is, you have to be willing to adapt your strategy over the years or you will get left behind. So yes. like you're, you're not going to have the same thing that you believe in today that you believe in 10 years from now. You might have a good chunk of what you believe in that's still the same, but you need to be able to, to trim the fats off the edges and make your, your, your investing strategy more streamlined and efficient. Exactly, because if anything, the investing world's constantly changing. There's products available today that didn't even exist 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah. Well, I mean, what what was the thing? I saw somebody posted a while ago about like the top 10 holdings in the S&P 500 10 years ago. I think there's only like two of them that are still the same. Yep. Like 80, 80 or 90 percent of the top 10 holdings changed in the S&P 500. Like I, th I think one of them was ExxonMobil, which is another stock I hold, was still in the top 10 10 years ago and it's still there today. But like... Oh. Apple, Facebook, like all these other companies, like they weren't in the top 10, 10 years ago. And now they're the the top. So it is. It's amazing how much uh, change has gone on. Yeah. Uh, um, OK, so next question for you. I and mean, we touched on this one a little bit, too, already. So what are the um, specific criteria you use when selecting your dividend stocks? OK, 
Now I have to use my notes. But it's all, <laughs> yeah. all right. I start. I'm going to tell everybody up front. I'm retired, so I have the time to do this. But first of all, I took the whole dividend champions list, and I, I put them on StockCharts.com. You know, if you have a uh, if you are a subscriber, you can have a list. And then you can tell it. Okay, I want you to run the charts one at a time. I'm just going to hit return. And I, I looked at the 20 year chart of every one of the dividend champions because I was looking for that rising chart over time. I don't care if they have a bad year or the COVID uh, pandemic dumps it for a while. So that was step one. Then, so I picked out of all the champions, the ones that did have a rising chart and preferably they're rising more than the S&P 500. So I don't know the numbers, but look, say the S&P 500 over 20 years went up 500 percent. I'm just faking a number. Then I was looking for stuff that was up 600 mm percent -hmm. or more. So that was step one. Um, step two, I would then flip over to value line and uh, make sure that it was rated A or higher by value line. And also I wanted to have a safety rating of one or higher. And this plays back to what you and I discussed. You don't want to be too picky. But the counterpoint in this case is there's so many of them, you'll have plenty to pick from. Mm -hmm. Now, that's two. The third one is um, I wanted to have a wide moat rating from Morningstar, which in English means it's a big, highly defended economic enterprise. Like somebody's not going to come and muscle in on their territory easily. A railroad would be an example. You know, not everybody can buy up land all across America and muscle in on Union Pacific. Yeah. And I'm going to mention on the side there that people listening here, they spend some work checking with their local libraries. They can probably find those two publications either at the library or sometimes available online, which you can then access from your home. And I just advise if, if you get an enormous freebie like that, send them a donation once in a while because a value line alone, I think, is close to $1,000 a year. Wow. So that was point three, the wide moat rating. Number four, I look for a dividend that doubles like every 10 years. So I just, and value line, you can literally see it because they show you about 13 years. And I look like how to do the last five, the last 10. I want to see an upward trend in the dividend. What's that compound growth rate? Just, I mean, do you have that? Do you know that number? Like, is it like 5% a year will double every 10 years? I think I do. 15% would double your money every five years so i believe that's more like seven percent okay. of a growth rate yeah because like it's always hard to figure out because it's like the compounding so it's like seven percent and then seven percent of that plus the seven percent so it, it gets a little weird exactly it does so let me think all right that's the dividend and that was coming from value line but there are lots of other sources you can get that um i then will rule out if their payout ratio or their debt to equity ratio is much worse than their direct peers. But once again, you get into a side piece of due diligence. Wait a minute. Is that really a direct peer we're looking at from this website? So you, you go by it, but you have to make sure you're being shown the correct judgment. Um, I'm trying to think. One company, Clorox, has a rather high debt to equity ratio, but you have to dig into it. You know, did they just do a new project this year or something that caused that? Mm -hmm. So the next one would be number six, it looks like. I like it to have a good return on invested capital, which is something we didn't touch on. And this is really unique. In all the hundreds of hours I've spent perusing all of these companies, I usually find two things occur every, almost every time when I find one that's a real rising stock over the, the decades. One, it usually has a, a good return on invested income, like 10% maybe or higher, and it's usually better than its peers. And the other one, there's a lot of pro and con on this, but you'll find in Value Line, they'll, they'll show you who already owns this company, and it will be a who's who, like Blackstone, Fidelity, Vanguard, they'll list off all State Street Bank, they're all in there. But inevitably, when I find somebody that's fit all my criteria, you'll have a good return on invested income for that company. Mm. Now that, and I can get that, you can get that from Morningstar and lots of other places. Now number seven, I then follow them 
until they become undervalued per Morningstar. And I keep Morningstar fair value in a spreadsheet with my whole watch list. So five minutes of updating, I can sort my watch list in order by most undervalued to least. And you'll see me post it once in a while in the group. So then I can produce in maybe 10 minutes a night what is most interesting to me. Then I turn to my email from stockcharts.com and it tells me of my same list, here are the ones that are a very serious technical low. Um, I use something I think I've discussed with Ben there. It's uh, called a, a full stochastic, but it goes back 144 days. So it's not a trading tool. It's, it's like you're looking at a long view of the market. So that was, I follow it to be undervalued, and then I look for them to hit that indicator. And another thing, this one's optional. But if the fear and greed indicator is way down to levels that can be seen across, they have a history of 11 years, so you can go back that far. That will influence me. I will then buy more than I normally bought. Is the is the fear and greed uh, index, is that, can you get that stock based or is that stock market based? It's market based, okay. but it has, like I, this is the subject I've studied since I was 30, like ever since I read Marty's wife's book. That fear and greed indicator is the best available free thing I've ever seen because it's based on seven different factors like junk bond rates versus good bond rates. And they mix it all together in a time tested formula and they go, well, this thing's looking pretty bad. And when that number gets very low, somebody was on the board the other day and they said, I look for it to get below 20 or, or even better 17. Well, he's been researching it because I've printed all the years and that's when it is really low. Hmm. And again, that's not perfect market timing or anything. But if you happen to walk in the supermarket and you see the stuff you like for 50 percent off, you already know you like Cheerios. Mm -hmm. So you buy the Cheerios. It's not that you were predicting the market or that you're going to do that day in and day out. But it is something that does happen. Yeah, that that brought me up to. That was number 8A and B. We did that. And that fear and greed thing is available on the Internet. Um, it updates live all day. Mm -hmm. oh, that's useful. And that's in my spreadsheets, too. Um, I have a paid account at stockcharts.com, which is surveying that one indicator, that stochastic. But it only surveys the stocks that I'm interested in and sends me an email at night then I still have to do my homework and make sure it's undervalued. Or another, for instance, do I already own too much of it? I have some stocks where I'm already up to 5% of the account, so it may be a great buy, but I don't want to add more. Because I've, I've been burnt on being too much in one position also, which was uh, that LoJack company I mentioned a while ago. Yeah. All right, so that's nine. Oh, and then uh, the last step of my process if I find everything, a candidate that's fulfilled all of that, I'll set modest buy limit orders at support levels like one, two, and three and begin to scale in. I never go all in, and I don't mind if my first buy, it falls another 5% or 10%, as long as it was already undervalued, it was already a giant, solid, boring dividend payer on which I'd done my research. So it, it's fine if it goes lower, but I'll just buy more. So it's, I'm just going to repeat what I said earlier. This is nice. This is how I go at it. But I'm good with computers, and I have a lot of access to this stuff. But in the long run, I've put it in a spreadsheet. Dollar cost averaging is your most reliable and simplest method that I've found. And I've literally put technical indicators in a spreadsheet and tried to beat the dollar cost averaging. It does not. Yeah. Because... That's good to hear because like it, uh, often, um, you know, the more complex, the better the results. But it sounds like this one, the simplest thing you can do, sounds the also seems to be the best one. Yeah, because a good stock is going up all the time. And if you're there waiting three months to buy it, you can miss some serious money. So it's uh, and it, but the thing to do, I proved it out in a spreadsheet. And that's what I recommend to everybody do. No matter what you hear or how solid it sounds, you've got to be able to go check for yourself mm -hmm. because the, the Internet, it's like the Library of Congress and the Wild West all mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. So you can hear it like 
you'll see it on the the stock market sometimes they'll they'll talk about the death cross and how scary it is mm -hmm. well if you go put the death cross and check a whole bunch of indexes it predicts about 99 out of five market declines so but again you have to be willing to go do the homework because it goes off all the time compared to the way they present it to you in the media yeah but yeah it, so um just for my own knowledge and anybody else that's wondering the same question when you do all your filters there was 10 of them right yes when you do those there's often not a big list that comes back right you're right and the list varies and i track that too for instance when 40 percent of my list is showing that it's down at those levels i've tracked that 40 percent is a number that repeats it goes back years and years 40 percent of them down during covid 40 percent showed up down during the prior sell-off i don't even remember the reasons for the prior sell-offs but so yes uh, only so many now right now i think 10 of mine are showing that I might want to buy them, but then I have to go do the due diligence because I think several of them are already on. Yeah. Well, and that's the, that's a big thing too, is cause like that's for anybody that doesn't have your own filters. I think that's a great way to identify whether you have enough filters or sometimes even if your filters are too strict, if um, like for me, for instance, I think the video I just posted um, the power five, there were 210 stocks that had ex-dividend dates of this coming week or, you know, this coming week coming up. I think the list went down to 74 or something like that when I filtered for the stocks that had a dividend streak of five or more years. And then that list went down to 21 when I filtered for a list for the ones that have outperformed the S&P 500 over the past 10. So, like, if I wanted to add another filter, say I'm looking for a stock in another sector, that might go down to three stocks. And, like... That's a good way to know whether you have a good amount of filters or if your filters are even good. Because if, if you end up filtering for dividend stocks, okay, you're at 2,000 stocks that pay a dividend or whatever the number is. And then you're just like, I want ones in the financial sector. Okay, you're at 610 stocks. Like, good luck looking through all 610. So that's why those filters are important because it'll just cut out a lot of the junk, it, like I said, trims the fat on all the stuff that you don't need to be wasting your time on. And you can really focus on, it's way easier to, like you said, look at 10 stocks or in my case, look, I look for, look through 21 stocks and like find the best numbers in each of them. And that's what I presented. So, um, that's a good way to do that and know that your filters are on the right path is if you can get a big list down to something that's manageable. Exactly. And I, I couldn't agree more. And, and like the other thing is when you're filtering, you need to filter for the mildest level you'd accept so that you see every possibility. Because if you bring the requirements down too tight, you might miss something that was just a hair away from what you would have been happy with. Yeah. So uh, I do that pretty much with mine. Like on that fear level, I, I go by the least or the, the common generic fear level that many years have gotten down to. I don't, I don't expect it to fit during the pandemic era, that one particular level. Yeah. So, and there's the guy that was talking about it on the group the other day was saying the same thing. But so mine is, it's kind of technically based, but I'm only buying good companies that are really solid because especially value line rated A, safety number one, so I can sleep at night. Yeah. That, and at the end of the day, like there's nothing nothing wrong with your filters or anybody else's filters. The biggest thing is having like making sure you have something that you can uh, compare yourself to. Um, and also that you can understand, you can follow all the things. Um, you're, you're dead on. So you kind of spoke on this one and, and now you can elaborate on it if you will. Um, how important is staying diversified and what rules do you use personally to help you achieve that? Okay. That is, it's definitely unique to me. And, and I'm not criticizing what the textbooks say or how other people want to go at it. I'll be as diversified as the stocks that fit my criteria will allow. So if you toss me up a sector that I don't have, but it's doing less results than the S&P 500, I'm not going there. Mm -hmm. It's like it would be nice to have that additional sector. But I actually I answered your question in here somewhere because off the top of my head, I can't really name them all off, but I can if I had a list. So, like, I have 
there it is, basic materials, consumer cyclicals, financial services, healthcare, industrials. But when you get to industrials, you gotta watch out because then you just included rails, heavy equipment, defense, technology. Um, so I'm all over the place and I'm beginning to have a presence in consumer defensive food stuff. Like I have McKesson, I just bought in a Hershey, I have McDonald's. As long as they fit the criteria I'm after, that's fine. But I wouldn't go and buy a sector that won't fit my criteria because I have a goal. I want to exceed the S&P. Yeah. I mean, that's important too, is like there, there's a difference. So I, I've gotten, this is probably the question that I wasn't expecting the best outcome from as far as like what I was taking away from it, but I've actually gotten the biggest variety of things to actually consider. Um, I had an interview, I don't know, two months ago, three months ago uh, with a guy named Kenyon. He's in the group. Um, yes. And he doesn't necessarily care about diversification. And I was like, man, that's interesting take. I was like, why, why is that? So he explained it and he was able to identify stocks like Broadcom and he's bought Broadcom. He, I think uh, Home Depot might have been one of his. I might be getting some interviews mixed up. But like he identified Broadcom and he identified a price that he wanted it at. He bought it at that price. He bought it at lower. It kept going lower. He kept buying it. He doesn't have that many stocks. He doesn't own any ETFs. But he doesn't believe in spreading himself out into other sectors that he doesn't believe in, which is what you just said. And he also doesn't believe in limiting things that are working. Like he's like, okay, I might have 40% of my portfolio in the technology sector, but technology is working and it doesn't need to work forever, but it's working for now. And at which point it doesn't work, I can transition into something else. But right. he's like, I'm not going to, you know, own communication services just to get a little slice in that pie over there when I don't like, it doesn't fit anything I want to do. It doesn't need that. Why wouldn't I just add that piece of the pie to something that's working? And I'm like, that's a very good point. I agree. And, and it brings up something we've touched on earlier. It's like, you can't go with all the textbook stuff that flies around the internet about what you're supposed to do. See, he's thinking for himself and he's not running with part of what the textbooks say, but he's, he's making money. What I'm doing doesn't agree with every textbook, but I'm making money. It's, and I, I had something I wanted to run by you too, that you'll see this all the time. People will come in and they'll say, I don't want to buy XYZ ETF or mutual fund because their uh, management fees are too high. But what you got to take into account is what is that fund delivering you? Would you pass up a 15% annualized fund that's going to charge you, let's say, 1.5% and in turn go buy an 11% fund that only charges you three quarters of 1%? Mm -hmm. The math doesn't work. Yeah. But the meme is really popular and everybody says it and it sounds good. But if there was one thing I could try to impart to everyone is you have to question everyone and do your own math. And if, if you don't know how to do the math, that's fine. You can ask people and I'll bet you on this uh, group, there's people that could tell you how to do a spreadsheet for what you want. Yeah. And, and that's important too. yeah, doing the math. Cause like at the end of the day, you can't, there's not a blanket response that like for me, every stock in the communication services sector is trash. Like I don't believe that. I just don't own any of them. None of them fit mine. And I, I honestly don't look deep into it. Like I'm not in uh, adding stock position right now anyway. I'm just building my own positions. I'm not adding new things. So like maybe when it's time for me to do research for my next buy, there might be one that pops up in there and then I'll own something. And then also doing the math and just saying like any – any stock that has an expense ratio above this isn't something you should consider. Well, if their returns take over for that, and they're like you said, if the S and P is returning twelve percent, this fund's returning fifteen percent, and it has a one percent payout ratio, you're still getting a fourteen percent return, which outperforms the S and P. And the other fund is getting a ten percent return and only has a point one percent expense ratio. You're still underperforming. Like, yeah, you're not paying, you know, Joe Schmo portfolio manager for it, but you're also making more for that. So, but that's also, uh, again, to just cloud the investing space even more, that's also not to say that you should ignore the expense ratio because you do need to check to see, to make sure that it's worth it. Um, one that I did a video on that did really well on my channel is the yield max. Yield max is a covered call strategy that I see everybody getting into. Uh, TSLY is a covered call on Tesla they were paying like a 70% dividend yield, which again, that's what people filter for. And that's the only thing. 
but that has a 1% expense ratio and it underperforms the market. So often, and I tell people this all the time, is you're going to have these funds, a lot of times they are higher yielders, where they will give you $75 in your left hand just to lose you $100 in capital appreciation in your right hand. And that's very important to understand. And that's that's pointed out in that group probably every week or every day. Because like as soon as somebody comes in with a high yielder, what do you think? I throw up the 20-year chart on it. Yep. And again, as we've discussed, I really believe it's each to his own. But the bottom line is, are you is your account going up or down? So if you look at one of those high yielders and even including the dividend, if your capital is going down, I say it's not serving you well. Yeah. At the They're, end of the day, that's kind of like – and then they, they justify it by like, oh, I'm dripping it. Like the – the I, I have a video that I'm going to be doing soon. I don't know if it will be out by the time this video this interview comes out. But I want to do a video comparing um, the yield max ETFs versus other covered call ETFs to see if – because like – People are under the impression that this this portfolio manager, the guy that created Yield Max, he's on to something new. He's doing something never been done before. He has like synthetic long positions or whatever fancy words you're going to try to say. At the end yep. of the day, it's a covered call strategy that's been done before. And yes. I kind of want to see if I can find any correlation between previous covered call strategies that just came in that are as fresh as the Yield Max ones, how they did when they first started, and now that they've been out for you know five or ten years, how they're doing now. And it's really cool to look at your dividend income every month. I'm like, oh, I'm making $1,000 in dividend income. I'm like, okay, your capital that you used to put in there is now worth $700 instead of the 1000 that you put in. And you're just basically, I, I always say it's like trying to save a, a sinking ship with a cup of water. Like, yeah, you're making it take a little bit longer, but eventually it's going to go down. Like, it's going to sink. And, you know, to your point. There are actually vehicles like there's a lot of covered call funds out there. They've existed for a long time. Once in a while on that group, people will mention uh, closed end funds, mm -hmm. which it's not EGI per se, but some of them specialize in keeping your capital fairly steady over time, but they pay six or seven percent. Mm -hmm. So you can't throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. But the specific thing you and I've discussed I don't think it serves anyone for their capital to get degraded that much over time. Even when you include the dividends and you're, everything's still going down, I don't think it serves you. Yeah. Or like that's like, so the, that yield max video I put out 90% of the comments are all telling me either. I, I reviewed them in too short of a time frame when I reviewed them for the maximum time frame that they existed. So I don't know how I'm supposed to add more time. It doesn't happen, but um, so I did that. And then they're also saying that I don't understand and they're go they're going to drip the funds and they're making this much in dividends versus somebody else making this much. Or in the case of Tesla versus TSLY, um, the total return of like it, it it's going to make sense. And over time, it'll actually catch up. And I'm like, OK, well, when I compare TSLY to Tesla, the fund that it's tracking, Tesla does not pay a dividend. TSLY pays 70 percent dividend. So uh, infinity percent more because it's 70 to nothing. And the total return of Tesla, which factors in dividends, which they don't pay, is still outperforming this fund that has, quote, it has the opportunity for both capital appreciation and depreciation and the 70 percent dividend is still underperforming the fund it covers. And, and that's the thing I hear mostly is, well, I'm making it up with the dividend. And I'm not denying that can be done with some of the vehicles, but. Also, some of the vehicles, when you throw up the long-term chart, you're losing capital, even with your dividend. And, okay, if you're down 5% over 10 years and you're retired and you need the money, I wouldn't argue against it so much. But if you're a younger person, it's burning your capital off at an even higher rate. I don't think it serves you. I, I'm totally in agreement there's a million ways to make money here. But the bottom line, where is your whole account going? That has to matter no matter what your method. Yeah, it, it's so I've never used this quote in like the investing or dividend space, but I use it often for like my powerlifting as um, there, I think Tim Duncan, the, the power forward for the Spurs said this. He said uh, he said, good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good is better and your better is best. So yes. basically like what I was saying about opportunity cost, like these funds, could you make you more money today? And yeah, it looks good. But like if you have a long time horizon. These things could be good, but why not go for better? And some, maybe some of those funds are better, but why not go for the best? Like, why not always try to improve? And like, is there something else better out there that might, 
I did a video, not to keep plugging the own channel, but like I've done a video called Yield Too Soon. And it's like the dangers of investing in dividend yield too soon, where it's like all these super high, very popular dividend or the very popular, super high dividend yield stocks versus some of these smaller ones that have really good dividend growth rates, but the yield's really small. And over time, I charted them and I'm like, not only in 20 years is the capital seven times what the capital of the other one was, but you're also making more in dividends because of the dividend growth rate. So I'm like, if your time horizon's more than tomorrow, you need to look further than tomorrow. You're right. I was just going to add to what you're saying, and I'm not talking about myself because there's a whole bunch of people in that group doing the same thing. But my gains in the account from boring dividend growth companies going up and paying a smallish dividend are far, far more than any dividend of 10% I could have been getting. Mm -hmm. The stock goes up much more than that over time. Yeah. So it's... It's the long game, like I was saying earlier. It really is the tortoise and the hare. But you don't want to be distracted by 9% now and your capital gets depleted. If you find 9% now and your overall capital is going up, that's great. God bless you and your system. Well, and, and the other thing that people don't realize is the dividend yield is a relation of the of the of how much they pay versus the stock price. So yes. when you're okay, like AT&T, I always pick on them, but like, they had their big 50% cut or whatever it was. And their yield went from like something crazy to something more manageable. But as the stock price keeps going down, their yields creeping back up. And now it's starting to get to almost the same point it was when it was deemed to be crazy before they cut. And I'm just like, you, you guys that are like, oh, this one used to pay a 7% yield and now it's paying an 11% yield. That's not because of a dividend increase. That's because of the stock price keeps going down. Yes, exactly. And, you know, also... When the news hits companies like that, uh, some people will say, well, the possible dividend cuts already priced in. I believe that's just another meme, because if you follow it, then the stock goes down more and more from the point somebody told you it was already priced in. Again, everybody, no matter what type of system they're doing, needs to do their own investing and their own research and due diligence. It's nice to have input from everybody, but if you can't check it for yourself and think it through yourself, it's going to be a problem. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So uh, question off topic, on topic. Um, it, you've been doing dividends for like the last nine years. Have you had any companies that have done dividend cuts? Um, and like, how do you handle that? I had one. Uh, I believe the name was Rollins. And if I remember right, they owned uh, a pest control company, but don't quote me. Um, but anyway, fa mostly family owned, not a normal industrial and they cut their dividend, I think, I'm going to say during the pandemic, but it could have been before that. But uh, I, I was up because I'd owned them so many years that I sold at a nice profit, but I didn't want a dividend cutter. So I sold them and I redeployed the money to something else off my watch list. I've been fortunate by design. I've chased so little stuff that was on shaky ground that dividend cuts haven't really been a problem for me. I, I hear a lot of people talk about dividend cuts like it's just part of the game. And I, I, I was just wondering, like, if that has to be part of the game. Like, I've never had a, a company that's cut the at least while I've owned it. I, I think Next Era Energy a long time ago paid a dividend and then that they've reduced it. And I think they're on a 29 year streak of paying and growing. So, like, I've had companies that have done that, but not since I've owned them. So I'm one, I'm like, I'm, I was just wondering selfishly. I'm like, I want, I wonder if it's, you know, par for the course, like as you do, as you're a dividend investor for a certain period of time, you're going to have cutters or if that's something that you can avoid. I think it's inevitable to have something just because as we were discussing, nothing is set forever and times change. But I also believe that if you take the excellent advice by people in that group about what metrics to go watch, uh, you can pretty much avoid a lot of that i mean for me all these stocks and it's been uh since 2014 i've had one cut and i own i think 40 or 45 of them at this point but every single one of them is a boring one that's not near that dangerous edge so it would be kind of inevitable i want to throw an aside though on next year energy they're primarily i think in florida mm -hmm. well I go to Florida and visit the grandkids uh, a couple times a year. I think next year of energy, unless they have a financial misstep, they're going to be fine. You would It's impossible to describe the amount of development going on in Florida. Yeah. I mean, if you see across from where my daughter's development is, 
an empty field. I'm going down there for Thanksgiving. By the next time I go down in four months, there will be a giant development constructed and done in that field. Yeah, the, and, and it's like that. I don't know what it is about the Northeast, but like, I'm, like I said, I'm from Pennsylvania. You said you're in Massachusetts, right? Yep. In, in the Northeast, I feel like they just take years to build this. Like, it's like, hey, we have to install a stop sign at this corner. I'm like, that's going to be a three-year project. I'm like, why does this take so long? And like, I, I moved to Oklahoma. They've built a skyscraper, a our version of Central Park. That's a literal mile downtown of like parks, basketball courts, fo- uh, uh, soccer fields, the whole nine yards. They built a trolley. They've like they a convention center, a new luxury hotel. They built all this in like seven years. And I'm like, that's like a, a the time it takes to build an on ramp in Pennsylvania. I think, especially in the Northeast, it's so congested and so many rules and regulations. So. Uh... It's probably that's what's going on. But I just want to throw that in that. I think that's a company with uh, its demand is not going to do anything except grow. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I do like that one. It's it's one of those that like I didn't know a ton about. But every time I filtered like it's actually on my power five that uh, came out this week. I think it's the highest yielder, which all that to say, like, I think the yields only like two point six, two point seven percent. And because of the filters I do of dividend streak, which means they pay and grow and outperforming the market, most of the high yielders fall off when you put those two fields on, which is yes. the importance of not just looking for yield. Because I could literally pull up the list, pull the list of uh, X dividend dates, filter for highest yield, and that's the winner. But like I did that when I very first started this series, and I felt bad because some of them I was just like, yeah, this one underperformed the market by $17,000 over the last 10 years. I was like, I don't want to recommend that stuff. But you're, you're doing a service because – you're helping people back up and get the longer view of something like that, which, like I said, I, I don't I, I think they can do many ways to make their money. But you got to back out, take the longer view. Is this thing really making me money or not? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do like that. Um, so uh, that kind of feeds into the next question. So do you have any favorite stocks that you always like to have or your favorite sectors that you always like to be in? I mean, I know you said a lot about industrials, but that's kind of a big, big sector. You know, to be honest, I don't have like a specific favorite. Like, you know, a lot of people like Tesla and I understand why I'm a car nut. So I I think Teslas are cool. Have you driven a Tesla? Uh, I have not driven one. I've been in one as a passenger and I can vouch for the fact that the acceleration legends are true. Yeah, it's by. So short story on that. My my, uh, father-in-law was here and he was here. uh, He's been here, obviously, a bunch of times. But he uh, came the last time and then the, all the, the test drive cars, because we have a Tesla service center, but in Oklahoma, for whatever weird political reason, they're legally not allowed to sell Teslas here. So you have to like okay. buy them through somewhere else and have them shipped here. Um, anyway, so you go there, it's just a service center, but you can do test drives. We went there the one time, all of them were gone for like end of year, they were getting new models in or whatever. We go there the second time and I, I've driven them several times already like all the only one i haven't driven yet is the x and that's the one with like the falcon doors which i think is the coolest looking one um i haven't driven that one yet but i drove the other ones and i i know the acceleration because we get right off right out of the uh, service center get on the highway i pull off to the side of the highway then i floor it just to feel it um and he was in the car and he you know he's sitting back he's sitting there real cool slouched in his seat i was like hey we're going to stop. We're going to do this thing. I was like, you might want to sit up and like get ready for it. He goes, no, nah, no, nah, I'm cool. I'm cool. I was like, okay. So we do it. Hit the guy. This is the model S. It's not the plaid. So it's not the 1.990 to 60, but it's like a 2.90 to 60. Very fast. Um, and we go and audibly out loud. He just, oh, 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 oh. And then, he goes, and then the next thing that he says out of his face is, I, my eyes were open, but I couldn't see. <laughs> I was like, so it's that fast, right? It and, is. Yeah. I saw one in Los Angeles, and when the light changed to green, everybody at the red light understood. Yeah. It's just <laughs> it, yeah. But, there, it, I do recommend, uh, off topic, on topic, if you get a chance to test drive one, just they're super fun. They're super. The regenerative braking is something you do have to get used to, where like when you let off the, you know, the quote unquote gas pedal, it like stops for you, not instantly, but it like it starts to slow down. So you have right. to like, you know how when you push the brake, you have to like push it slow and like order to like not jerk. It's like yep. that with the gas pedal where you have to like let off the gas slowly in order to not jerk to a stop. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I so that's, that. but the idea behind that is if you use a Tesla right, you'll never need to replace the brakes because it doesn't necessarily use the brake pads. It uses as regenerative braking. 
Okay. Which is very I, cool. But yeah, I highly recommend anybody that's uh, just in for a fun time. Obviously, don't you're not obligated to buy one right afterwards, but test drive a Tesla. They're very fun. I will. I was going to jump back to your question about favorites because for some reason, I really was hoping that Republic Services would get down to a buy level and it was like uh, Costco. It got closer. So I bought it because the Republic and waste management I mean, look what they do every day. Mm -hmm. There's going to be trash forever. Yeah. So I got into them. I haven't got waste management, but I would have called that a favorite because I, I wanted to. That felt to me like a cornerstone stock. Pepsi, which I just added to, I feel like is a cornerstone stock. I'm just looking at the others. They're, they're not exciting. I, I think that Hershey is going to be a cornerstone stock. And you got to have like, oh, and I found a few that I kind of like. They're not big names. So like Illinois Tool. I own them. Uh, ITW. Yep. It's a dividend king. Yeah. And uh, Leco, they make uh, welding equipment, but like they're one of the biggest players in the whole game. You look at their stock, they've been going up for many years. Um, but that's really about it. I, Can I give I you have... one to look into? Yep. Uh, stock ticker L-I-N. Lynn. Is that a gas company? Um. I don't like I mean, it's, propane. I, I, I think it's in the I'm pretty sure it's in the industrial side. It might be materials. I don't remember. I do so much research. I don't remember which one's which. But I know uh, I think, spoiler alert for anybody that hasn't seen the video. Um, yeah. They were my best 10 year returns for the power five that I just did. And in the last right on my list. I yeah. already own them. <laughs> yeah. They're, yeah. The, uh, L.I.N. So in the last 10 years, L.I.N. would I think it was. Ten thousand dollars into two hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars with just yeah. reinvesting dividends on a lump sum ten thousand. So that's not like you dollar cost averaging or anything. It's literally yeah. lump sum ten years ago. I'm like, that's wild. And it's not a well-known name, and yet look at the results. Yeah, and so, so, and you might be able to help me on this, especially since your your expertise in like Excel sheets and stuff like that. Two things I've wanted to do is I want to see correlation between the the best returning uh, stock, dividend stocks over a period of time and the correlation between their payout ratio, their dividend yield, and their dividend growth rates. Because I feel like every time I do this thing and every time I get to the best 10-year returns, most of the time the dividend yields under 1% or very close to 1%. The dividend growth rates are always anywhere between 8 and 15%. And then the 10-year the performance is 20 30% year over year. Like compound growth rate, like it's ridiculous, like great growth rates. And then the other, so that's one, like one idea I have in my head. The other one is if you go on Seeking Alpha, there's plenty of other websites you can do it, but you can see the dividend raises and the dividend cuts every day. I wanted to do one specific, well, I guess I could do one on both, but I want to do one on specifically the dividend cuts. And I want to find out like what is the average payout ratio and what is the average yield of stocks that are cutting their dividend? Because I feel like like I never go through a, a, a that sheet of dividend cuts, and I never see a company that's got a twenty percent payout ratio with a three with a one percent dividend yield, two percent dividend yield. It's always I have an eighty eight percent payout ratio, and I have a thirteen percent dividend yield. They're getting a cut. I think that you just solved you know the reason. That's what goes on. It, I think it's really strongly related to those ratios, and and just you know this group is so great about that because there are people in there that will repeat that to everyone. I, I mean, I've learned so much there that I didn't know. It's great. And so I think you solved it. Sometimes you have to like, at the end of the day, like I hope that whether it's one person that watches this and we can teach them a lesson that they don't need to learn for themselves. But sometimes you just need to spend your own money and learn your own lesson. Like you, you just need to lose your own money. And then you're like, Oh, okay. That's what they were talking about. Like, that's just how it works. You're right, because it's easy for somebody at age 71 like me to say, you know, you need to learn the lessons and be careful and everything. But when I was that age, I, I ran into the same walls and butted them with my head. But I, I just wished I'd have known that the human mind has a tendency to convince it things of, that are not true. Mm -hmm. So if you can listen to an opposing point of view and give the guy a foot in the door into your own mind and just ponder what he said, I think it can be a big help. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, okay, so we got two more questions. Uh, one's tips, and this, and then we have this one. So, 
Um, this question is, are there any dividend myths or misconceptions that you wholeheartedly disagree with and you would like to debunk? Okay, now this is a dividend myth. I don't know. I'm not going to use the word debunk, but I would like people to consider something. There's one that goes around that says uh, past performance is no guarantee of future results, which we touched on earlier. Now, I 100% agree, but usually when it's brought up, it's on a your stock versus mine type of thing. You have to have a caveat to that. That applies to both stocks, the other guys and yours. But then we, we touch back on, you said it first, and it was what I was going to say. If you look at a company and they've been managing wisely and raising everything for 15 or 20 years, I think that counts for something. I'd mm -hmm. rather go mm -hmm. with that guy than the ones that's up and down like a skyrock. And um, uh, there was one other thing. Oh, I think it was my tips. Oh, yeah. We already touched on the other one about uh, you can't beat the market. Well, there's um, a whole long bunch of people that have. And somebody posted in that group, I forget his name, but he got up to five years. He's ahead of the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. And I believe you got to get out to the 10 year mark. Like that's my own personal criticism for me. Like I'm only a bit impressed when I got to 10 years. Yeah. But uh, I think that's a meme. You know, in other words, um, it's a thing that it sounds good. Everybody firmly believes it and they pass it around. But I don't think it's true because otherwise there wouldn't be so many uh, mutual fund managers that actually did beat the market. Yeah. And I don't know how many other brokerages offer that uh, money weighted return that we were speaking about earlier, because yes. I know in Fidelity, like when you go to your performance tab, you can see your time weighted up top. You can see your money weighted. Then you can set your benchmarks, which I just do the, the major ones, the Russell, the S&P, the NASDAQ and the Dow. And I just and it'll show you now those are. If my so it it's a little annoying because it's obviously not going to be apples to apples, but it's at least fruit to fruit is you're comparing to the S&P 500 time weighted returns with your yeah. money weighted returns. So it's not exactly even, but I'm also do I'm investing in mine money weighted because I'm investing in these stocks instead of the S&P 500. So the S&P 500 would be time weighted because I'm not adding money or removing money while mine would be money weighted because I am. So exactly. Um, I didn't think of that. Yeah. Cause I mean like, that's the thing It's like, if I were to go to my Roth IRA and I were to look at my S and P 500 fund that I'm investing in, I could look at that one money weighted versus money weighted. Um, yep. but it, it's, it's not. So like, that's, that's one thing to consider, which is a little annoying, but I don't think there's any way that fidelity could look at a, if you would have put this amount of money in the S and P 500 at the same time that you put that money in the S and P or in your, in your stocks, this would be your money weighted versus your current money weighted. So you might have to do that on your own, but like most people, that's a barrier to entry. So that, that is interesting that you mentioned that because I would think with all of their millions of dollars of computers and high end tech staff, if you can do it to the client's account, I would think you could percentage do it to the S and P 500. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be the coolest way to do it. Like, Hey, instead of putting, you know, your $30,000 in your 12 different holdings or whatever it is, if you would have put at the same, it has to be the same date, same time, whatever, instead of buying Apple at 12 o'clock today, you bought VOO at 12 o'clock today and like do a money weighted return on that. Like I said, you can figure it out on your own, but you'd have to do it separately. Fidelity doesn't have it. So I don't know. If you know enough of us that watch this, suggest that the fidelity if they'd be able to do that or not. But yeah, you know, I think I'm at least going to write to their customer service and talk about that because you raise a really legitimate point. Because I know in my account, you have to account for the fact that I took out a down payment for a car out of the darn thing. That yeah. should be factored in. If it was still there, you'd be still higher. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you could be. It could be either way. Like if the market went down and you took out ten grand, like you took out ten grand, the market went down, you didn't lose money on that ten grand. But if the market went up three percent, you missed out on you know that that three percent of ten grand. So exactly. Yeah, I I do. I think a lot of people. Uh, that's why I appreciated that guy's screenshot because a lot of people post, oh, here's what my returns are versus this. I'm like, well, is that time weighted or money weighted? It makes it. Like close, it doesn't make that big of a difference. But I think when I do my screenshots at the end, when I do like year to date, like you can see a, a modest difference. And I've only been investing in Fidelity for like two years. So like I don't have the three year chart yet. So like 
mine will be like already a percent, percent and a half difference between time weighted and money weighted. And that's only in, in one year. So I'm like, once it gets to three years, it could get the four or five percent. When you talk about big numbers, four or five percent is a big number. So, um, and it could, at the end of the day, the worst, <laughs> worst case scenario is the time weighted ends up being better. And it would have been better if I had just stopped touching it, uh, <laughs> which is more than likely probably what will end up happening is like the best thing you can do is just get out of the way, like invest your money and stop touching it. Well, there's, you brought up a good point that I would have mentioned along with my mistakes. I inherited some money when I was 30 years old from my grandfather. And it's just what you finished saying. If I had left it the heck alone. I'd be talking to you from a yacht. <laughs> that's that's what oh. I, I that's been a, a piece of advice given from many others on the thing is uh, identify what you want to do and then just stop touching it, like leave it alone. Yeah, and and to you know just to to uh, reinforce the whole concept, what did my grandfather own? The same boring dividend growth stocks that I own now. Yeah, it's this is the way to go. I mean, I hate to sound like uh, what is that show the um, it's a spinoff of Star Wars, The Mandalorian. Yeah. And he goes, this is the way. Yeah. Yeah. I see people in the group say that sometimes. I mean, it, but like the, at the end of the day, like results matter. And like, it, if it works, it works. Like, like nobody's reinventing the wheel. The wheel works. Like it's kind of one of those things. So. Exactly. Um, okay. So last one, and you might've touched on this one a little bit with your last response. So somebody's watching today's interview. They've decided that not only are they going to start investing, but they're going to start dividend investing. So you don't need a tip of getting started. What would be your tip or tips to somebody that is going to start investing and they are going to dividend invest? Okay. The first tip, uh, every tip I'm going to say I would have given to myself or I wish someone had. It's like you've got to forget about rapid riches and what's the hot stock all your friends down the hall are buying and so on. And you take a group like the dividend growth group here, and uh, and I'm not getting a kickback. I'm just very impressed with the group. <laughs> I've been a member for years. You you take the advice and you find yourself good, solid dividend stocks. You do your research. Don't don't put something out on the group and go. I need thoughts about Cisco. What do you think? You get a. You can accept people's ideas, but then you better go do your homework, even if you have to drive to the library and find the value line. Even so better you, is coming to the group or a anywhere, coming to a group with your idea. Like I, I can't stand when people do what you're just talking about, where they they don't even necessarily identify a stock. They probably heard of a stock and they're just like, hey, uh, Hershey, what are your thoughts? I'm like, well, what are your thoughts? Like, what do you exactly. like about it? Like, why are you bringing it to my attention? And even if they want to be anonymous, say your thoughts. You're going to learn something either way. And, you know, I, I see the moderators touch this every week and I really agree. There's no need to be harsh to somebody. It's just like, tell us a bit about what you think, and we'll tell you a bit about what we think. Um, but it's definitely, to get to your question, They, I advise going the slow route. Another thing I really advise, if they've got a job anywhere that will do some matching contributions to retirement, take it. I used to listen to a, a, a news show, a finance show. They raved about that. Just take that money because... So if they match your three percent, you're getting an extra three percent a, a year. It's a free one hundred percent return. Yeah, exactly. You didn't even do anything yet, but choose your stuff. You can use the fractional share trading, so you don't have to bulk up on any one stock. And but do the research and and like we touched on much earlier, use the long term charts. Make sure the darn thing really has been going up over time, because I've said it in that group a million times. If it was as easy as grabbing a few tips off an internet group, we'd all be typing on a yacht. It, <laughs> yeah. Just not like that. Yeah. You know, so I'm trying to see if I missed anything. But the, the main thing of my rap is, oh, yeah, that was the rap about it's a slow game. Play it careful and just be unrelenting. You know, if you can only save five bucks a week, do it. If you get a raise, jack that up. Uh, if your wife starts work and you get a little more money, jack that up and before you'll know it and this happened with my stepdaughter all of a sudden she got 14 grand in her account just from a little bit all the time going in there and uh, the other thing a lot of people want to do reading and there's a lot of great books about dividends but if you want to get an interesting perspective i would recommend that book by marty zweig it's called winning on wall street it's ancient 
probably 40 years old, but still in print. But he will show you that the market doesn't work the way the, you would think from listening to the news and everything. That when, when those news stories are the most discouraged and the people are coming into the dividend group saying, I don't know, what should I do? What am I going to tell my kids? Um, that's when you should be. And that's when a lot of the older members of that group, that's when they are buying. Mm -hmm. They're not plunging in. They're not mortgaging the house but they're buying. Mm -hmm. And there was, I'm going to give you an old story I heard about the Rothschilds family in France hundreds of years ago. They paid a runner to go to the Battle of Waterloo and they told him, we don't care how it ends, just get back here and tell us what happened. And then they knew which way to place their investments. It's an interesting thought. Wow. And Marty Zweig's book is the same thing. He shows you chapter and verse that when the whole world is screaming that it's the end of the world and you should sell everything, that, my friend, is when you might want to be buying, but with the caveat, quality stuff. You know, I'm not saying go out and buy some speculative thing and hope for the best, but you might want to add to your general dynamics or your LIN, yeah. you know, the good ones. Yeah, yeah, I agree with all that. That's Those are really good takeaways because um, I know a lot of people's uh, typical, you know, advice is, you know, don't chase the yields, like have your have your filters, Um understand your filters, make sure the filters are something you can follow. Um, also, yeah, like be doing your own research. Like I, I encourage people to do that with like even the power five that I put out every week. Power five isn't, Hey, here's five more stocks for you to buy every week. Cause you'd have a billion stocks by the end of the year. The idea is here's five stocks that like, whether you're a investor for long term uh, and you want like consistent growth rates over a long period of time, or you want high dividend growth rates or good 10 year returns or even the last one I mentioned is the highest percentage off the 52 week high because that shows that it does support that level because it was there and it's come down. Now that's up to you to add that to your watch list and determine why did it drop off its 52 week high? Why is it down 28%? Is it down 28% for good reason, bad reason? Is there room for growth again here or like what, whatever? So like I've had some people, the, a, guy, a guy commented, I think it was this morning, said that he bought two stocks off my power fives. And another guy last night commented and said it's his favorite series on YouTube. He looks forward to it every week. It's just like, I'm not telling you to buy any of these stocks. I'm giving you, I'm basically doing the research. Here's a small list of quality stocks for you to research and figure out if they're right for you. Exactly. And you find yourself having to say that all the time. When, when I post the watch list of mine undervalued, I always say, this is to give you ideas of what you might want to check on your own. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. It's it's all important. I I think all that stuff's good. Hopefully, somebody will take this interview away. And you know, it's it's two hour interview, but if you can learn one thing, um, that's that's you know, that's it, it. That one thing that you learned today, if you're especially if you're new in your journey, could make you hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars off of off of just good solid principles to make you a good investor. So exactly. And then and then when you're watching this thirty years from now, you could be typing back on your yacht. And then <laughs> you're welcome. Um, but yeah, Steve, it's been, it's been an honor. It's been a pleasure. I enjoyed speaking with you today. Um, if you have anything to plug any, any blogs, any channels, anything that you'd like the people to know before we sign out. The, the only two things I would plug is your channels. Cause I've watched them and enjoyed them. And also the dividend growth investing group there at Facebook. Like I said, folks, I have no connection to them except they've been a vast learning source for me and there's a 20, 30 people there that are just extremely valuable in what they have to say. They might not speak every day, but boy, they've got some good stuff. And that, and you know, study, be willing to put in the work, take your time and don't chase rockets, chase the, uh, the turtles, because that's the way it works. And that concludes another insightful episode of Dividend Discussion. I hope you found inspiration and valuable takeaways from our engaging conversation. If you're hungry for more dividend investing wisdom, be sure to subscribe to Dividend Obsession and hit that notification bell to stay up to date with my latest interviews, tips, and strategies. Remember, the journey to financial independence is a marathon, not a sprint. Keep applying the lessons you've learned and stay committed to growing your wealth using dividends. Together, we can create a community of dividend investors sharing knowledge and supporting one another. If you enjoyed this episode, don't hesitate to share it with other investors that are equally passionate about the power of dividends. Let's spread our dividend obsession far and wide. But until next time, see you.